What's up everyone, welcome back to a brand new video. As you could probably guess, this scenario was a heavily requested one. Some of you may have actually requested it yourselves. And there's a reason that I put it off for so long. To be honest, I never really touched this one because I felt like a lot wouldn't change. Realistically. However, there are ways to be creative with it that make it kind of a huge deal. The whole concept of this scenario isn't really that crazy, it's just the Saiyans growing their tails back after they were cut off originally. But in terms of the effects of this, well, we can get really creative with it. And with the ideas I have for this scenario, well, there's a lot of things we can do. For this part, let's set a like goal of 3500 likes, and if we hit that, I'll continue with another part to this series. Anyways, let's begin discussing what would happen if Saiyans kept their tails. So I don't think I need to explain the premise to you, it's pretty simple. Instead of Saiyan tails disappearing permanently, they actually grow back here, and are no longer a recessive trait like they were with Goten and Trunks as Toriyama explained. The first time we see an example of this is with Goku, during the five years after Dragon Ball ends, or at least original Dragon Ball, Goku's tail would suddenly regrow one day. This isn't new for him, but he's kind of surprised. It's been a while since it's been back, and it seems like Kami removing it didn't work. And it's not just him that has a tail, of course Gohan has one too. At first, this wouldn't really affect much. During the Raditz fight, Raditz may try and grab Goku's tail as well. But after all the trauma that his tail has had, it probably wouldn't work. While on the other hand, it works to paralyze Raditz. Besides that, nothing really changes about that fight. Tails weren't really involved too much besides Raditz's being grabbed. But following this fight, there are some interesting results. When Goku's with King Kai, of course he does the same training as normal. But King Kai is kind of worried about Goku's tail. He knows that he could transform without even knowing. And tells Goku he has an idea. He wants to see if he can control that great ape form somehow. So instead of it being dangerous and reckless, he could use it to his advantage during the battle. But there is one issue. If Goku did turn into a great ape on King Kai's planet, well clearly the planet isn't really suited for that. I mean in terms of space, he'd take up most of the planet once he transforms. So King Kai wants to see if maybe there's a way to channel this power without transforming. It's kind of a long shot, but hey, it's worth trying. So alongside teaching him Kaioken and the Spirit Bomb, they try and work on this occasionally. Although the results are kind of mixed, they can't really find a way for Goku to channel it without transforming. At one point he actually does turn into a great ape which makes King Kai very fearful. But luckily with some practice beforehand, Goku's able to control this. The real issue now is seeing if he can actually control it while maintaining its humanoid form. Time passes and eventually, the Saiyans arrive on Earth. And much like normal, Goku runs kinda late. So the battle between Nappa and the Z Fighters goes pretty much the same. Goku arrives on Earth, ready to fight. He has Kaioken which he knows works, but it is very draining. In terms of power, him turning into a great ape would be more beneficial, but he still doesn't know if he can fully control it. At least not without turning giant. So for now, he avoids using that. Not that he even can because he can't create an artificial moon and there is no moon in the sky right now. Using Kaioken, he defeats Nappa normally. And the first parts of his fight with Vegeta go pretty much the same. But then, Vegeta brings up something that's pretty concerning. He creates an artificial moon. But this may work to Goku's advantage. He can control his grade 8 form, so maybe if he transforms, that would help, even if he turns giant. But this gives him the opportunity to test something. He remembers back to when he fought King Piccolo. Briefly, when he was laying the finishing blow, he felt this grade 8 power coursing through him. It was the same when he drank the water that Korin gave him. He didn't really use the form, but somehow he channeled the power of it briefly. And with his training from King Kai, he keeps this in mind too. So he looks up towards the moon, allowing the power to course through him. But he also tries to resist the transformation. As Vegeta turned into a grade 8, he looks down at Goku. Seeing that, despite the fact that he has a tail, he's not transforming. Ah well, this is better for him. It means he could just simply step on Goku. So, he does. He lifts his foot up in the air, and stomps it down. Krillin and Gohan look away, expecting Goku to be crushed. But then Vegeta feels shocked. Somehow Goku's resisting his foot. Vegeta's leg is then pushed up and he falls on his back. He gets up and looks at Goku. Something about him is different. He's not using that Kaio whatever that he was using before. But he seems stronger. His hair is spiked up, and although Vegeta can barely see it, it looks like his eyes are yellow. He's not too sure what he's seeing. But Goku knows exactly what has happened. It worked. He was able to control this power and use it in his humanoid form. But there is one issue. Vegeta is still way stronger than him, even with the 10 times boost in power that the Uzaru form gives him, or I guess the wrathful form in this case. Vegeta is stronger in terms of power. But Goku has the advantage of being small. Yeah, Vegeta is still speedy even when transformed. But being small allows Goku to be more nimble, focusing on evasion rather than attack. So this is what I was referring to in the beginning of the video when I said I wanted to be creative with this. Of course, this can be done without a tail, as seen with Broly who had his removed. But I'm going to include it here because not only is it doable, but it makes the scenario a lot more interesting if we introduce this form to Goku. As I mentioned before, having tails wouldn't really alter the series too much. Unless we get creative with it like this. And this is perfectly within the realm of reason. 
So, what's the catch here? Goku got stronger and he didn't have to transform to do it. Well, he has partial control, but eh, he doesn't really know. He may be losing the grasp on this power. He feels an odd rage overcoming him, kind of like we saw with Broly. But thankfully he has some help in this fight. Gohan transforms too. Although he's of course going to be giant and not be able to control it. Together, the two of them fight Vegeta. Gohan serves as a great distraction as Goku goes around Vegeta trying to cut his tail off. He's quick enough to run around Vegeta and try and evade his attacks. While Gohan basically acts as a bait, Goku borrows Yajirobe's sword, and he tries to work quickly. Although he would love to actually fight with his form, he knows Earth is at risk and he needs to work quickly. Jumping around, he dodges Vegeta's attacks, zooming under Vegeta's legs and getting behind him. With the katana out, he jumps up directly into Vegeta's tail, cutting it clean off. Vegeta then shrinks down, detransforming, as Gohan then goes to attack him. This does pose another issue though. Gohan is basically berserk here, and they're gonna need to stop that somehow. Thankfully, this would be a lot easier than Vegeta. While Gohan's in rage attacking Vegeta, Goku quickly jumps around him, apologizing as he slices through Gohan's tail too. Good, now that that's over, it means they've won the fight. Goku's still retaining his form, and Vegeta seems defeated. But remember, Goku's in kind of a fit of rage right now. He does partially have control over it, but the wrathful form is called wrathful for a reason. He tries to quell this rage. But seeing Vegeta doesn't help this at all. He's debating whether or not he should kill Vegeta. Normally he wouldn't really be like this, but due to him being in the state he is, the thought is crossing his mind. And he's more than willing to do it. But something is still holding him back. It's not that he cares about Vegeta or anything. It's more so he knows that he has to control the form. If he kills Vegeta, that means he's giving into the anger. So Goku struggles with this choice as Vegeta crawls away, escaping into his space pod. And luckily, it works, because Goku resisted, the anger is quelled, and he goes back into his base. That power is definitely pretty helpful, but he needs a better control over it if he's going to use it again. Of course he's going to have a great opportunity for that soon, because they'll have to go to Namek to revive all their friends. Thankfully this time, Goku doesn't have to end up in the hospital. He goes along with Krillin and Gohan and Bulma since he wasn't as badly injured. He doesn't need to wait for any Senzu bean, although this means his training isn't going to be too effective. Because his trip was delayed in the original story, he was able to do gravity training on the way to Namek. Of course he could still train with Krillin and Gohan on the ship, but it's not nearly as good as gravity training. But that's still fine. This means Krillin and Gohan are going to have an easier time since Goku's actually there with them now. After some time passes, they arrive on Namek. And of course, Frieza's army and Vegeta are there too. For now, Goku and his group are able to lay low. They want to collect the Dragon Balls before anyone else can. This leads them to the village that Dodoria was terrorizing. The one where Dende and Cargo live. They do want to lay low, but they also want to intervene here. Dodoria is pretty scary though, but Goku's confident. He jumps in, wanting to defend the village. They're aware that those scatters can track people, and if they want to remain low, they need to work quickly. Making sure he has control, Goku powers up into Kaioken times 4 very briefly. Definitely strenuous, but for the short period of time, it works. Quickly and immediately he defeats Dodoria, as Krillin uses a scatter Kamehameha to hit all the soldiers there. All the scatters in the area are destroyed, and this allows him to remain low. With the villagers, Goku, Krillin, and Gohan escape. While they're out looking for Dragon Balls, let's cover Vegeta for a bit. After getting back to his outpost and being healed, his tail actually did grow back this time. Originally it didn't. And he wants to see if he could do what Kakarot was able to do. He has perfect control over Grid 8, so he just needs to try and channel that power into his humanoid form. Utilizing it without transforming. It seems like that's what Kakarot did, and maybe he can do it too. Of course, he doesn't need it right away. He could still kill Kui pretty easily. But when Kui dies, Frieza of course notices that Vegeta's here. Up to no good. He contacts Dodoria, but Dodoria doesn't respond for some reason. Whatever, Dodoria is probably okay. He'll just send Zarbon instead. Vegeta continues going around the planet, trying to get Dragon Balls and killing Frieza's army. But eventually Zarbon does catch up to him. The two briefly face each other, and Zarbon ends up transforming. Thankfully, right before he encountered Zarbon, Vegeta did something to help him. Along with him, he brought a projector that can make a fake moon, exactly like the Saiyan space pods were able to do. He clicks a button to activate it. And now Zarbon's pretty scared. He knows that Great Apes are powerful, and he might need a call for backup. And he's about to do it, but Vegeta doesn't transform for some reason. It looks like he's still in his base form. Vegeta's looking directly at the moon, trying to gain a control over this power. Zarbon just assumes it isn't working, but really, it is. For a brief period, Vegeta ends up controlling this power. Although he knows it's fleeting, so he needs to work fast. Even with his perfect control over Great Ape, it still isn't enough for this. He at least needs a little bit more practice before he can do it willingly. Maybe he'll even be able to do it without a moon. Vegeta turns to Zarbon, now with the yellow eyes. Zarbon laughs seeing that Vegeta's plan didn't work. He didn't even transform. But Vegeta dashes in front of Zarbon. And with one hit, he kills him. Vegeta's surprised that he never thought of this before. But hey, better late than never. 
Now in solitude, Vegeta wants to see if he can control it any further. He may need it if he's going to continue going around Namek like this. And he's made good progress so far. He's defeated a lot of soldiers, and most importantly he has two Dragon Balls. He can chill here for a bit, trying to hone this power more so he can use it later on. It shouldn't be too hard for him to get the hang of it. It'll be much easier than it was for Goku. Frieza of course realized that there's people sabotaging now. He heard a weird distress call from Zarbon that suddenly cut out. He just cancelled it for some reason. And now, both him and Dodoria are silent. Frieza's gotten no response from either. And it wouldn't make sense for it to just be Vegeta doing this. This is all happening across the planet, so it's gotta be more than one person involved. Frieza has one Dragon Ball as of now, but he's concerned that maybe other people will get them. By this point, Goku's group arrives at Guru's place. They now have a total of three, and Guru gives them their fourth. The next part of their plan is going to be tricky though. They need to get the remaining three balls from Vegeta and Frieza. Unless they're still at the villages, which is highly unlikely. This means they'll have to fight Vegeta again. And that alone is a pretty big issue, but there's also Frieza, who they know nothing about. All they know is what King Kai mentioned about avoiding him. They suddenly sent something too. It seems Frieza's on the move. He's not coming towards them, but it seems like he is traveling somewhere. And he's moving pretty quickly. Frieza decided to intervene himself, going to find Vegeta. Vegeta of course senses this too and hides as Frieza heads to Zarbon's last known location. But even with Vegeta's new power, he's not going to avoid Frieza. Frieza ends up finding him, and luckily Vegeta's already hidden the Dragon Balls. This will end up saving his life, because right after, Frieza immediately defeats him. Even with his wrathful form, Frieza is simply too strong for Vegeta to face. But he doesn't kill Vegeta. Vegeta knows where some of the Dragon Balls are, and Frieza obviously needs that information. So, he takes Vegeta back to the ship to heal him and get that info. While at Guru's place still, everyone senses this and they don't know how they'll be able to face Frieza when this is going on. None of them are anywhere near strong enough, even Goku. But thankfully, Guru might have a solution. He wants to help everyone by unlocking their potential. They're doing a good thing by defending Namek, and they deserve the Dragon Balls. So, he unlocks the potential of everyone there, including Goku, who wasn't there originally. This gives a pretty big buff to everyone. So let's briefly discuss some power levels so you know where everyone is. Krillin's a bit stronger due to his training with Goku on the way to Namek. And when you factor that in with Guru's ability, that puts him at 100,000. For good measure, Nail's potential was unlocked too, just so they'd have an extra fighter. He's already expressed a lot of his potential, but this still does buff him to 150,000. Going off Gohan, he gets a pretty big boost like normal, although he's a bit tougher to place on here. After the fighting he's done so far and the training he had with Goku, plus his natural potential, let's just say he's at the same level as Nail is. For simplicity's sake, as for Vegeta, he got a pretty bad beating from Frieza and Vegeta had some pretty crazy power jumps on Namek. Since this was his only beatdown though, we'll hold him back a bit and say he's only at 200,000 right now, although that goes up to 2 million when he uses Wrathful. As for Goku, let's say he went up to 300,000. He still did get pretty injured in the Saiyan Saga, and he does have some crazy potential as we know. Just having access to Wrathful increases that, and when he does use it, that boosts his power to 3 million. Oh yeah, little side note here, Gohan gets his tail back too after getting it cut off. Probably worth mentioning. Thankfully no one has to fight yet, but they're going to have to once the Ginyu Force arrives, because Frieza just called them in. He wants them to search the planet for Dragon Balls and to figure out who else is there. Since it's definitely not just Vegeta working against him. As he calls them and waits for their arrival, Vegeta is eventually fully healed, and he's left alone in the ship. Much like normal, this allows him to create a distraction, stealing the Dragon Ball that Frieza has, while also escaping. Although while Vegeta was out of commission, a lot happened during this time. Goku's group ended up stealing the two Dragon Balls that he hit, putting their total up to six. Vegeta's furious when he sees that his Dragon Balls are missing, becoming completely enraged. And from this anger, there's a side effect. Although it's not as violent as what happened with Broly, we saw there that when he got angry, he instinctively turned into his wrathful form. And Vegeta's feeling such rage right now that that happens to him too. To make things worse, he sees the Ginyu Force arriving. And he's already pissed as is, so he decides to just end this now. Aiming up at the sky, he launches a massive attack that blows up all their ships before they land, killing the Ginyu Force in the process. His power is incredible and every scouter that's still working explodes, including Frieza's. Of course, he would also notice this once he sees the Ginyu Force's ships turn into fireworks. This angers Frieza even further. He was already mad that Vegeta escaped and stole a Dragon Ball, and it seems he's still meddling with plans. Frieza has to start taking things seriously. This time, he'll kill Vegeta and for good. As for Goku's group though, they're a little bit concerned. Yeah, they have six Dragon Balls, but from what they can sense and what they see on the Dragon Radar, it seems Vegeta may have the last one. And this would have been fine if Vegeta was alone, but it seems Frieza's heading in his direction. Otherwise, they could have easily defeated Vegeta and got it that way. But now Frieza himself is intervening, and he's definitely not playing around here at all. They try and plan their next move as Vegeta awaits Frieza's arrival, sensing him flying nearby. Vegeta's confident. With this new power, he might be able to kill the Emperor. Frieza arrives, ready to face off against Vegeta. 
After getting access to the Wrathful form for himself, Vegeta feels confident that he can fight Frieza, but actually facing Frieza in person is a whole different animal. The two are both equally angry, with Vegeta utilizing his anger for power. I don't think any words would be exchanged here, the two would definitely get down to business right away. Just as quickly as Frieza arrived, the two clash. Frieza is definitely pretty strong, even in his first form, but as of now, in terms of raw power, Vegeta actually surpasses Frieza, by a pretty good amount too. That's mainly due to Wrathful. Due to the power from that form, he's actually holding his own pretty well, eventually getting a clear upper hand against Frieza. His first form simply isn't enough. And with Vegeta's pure malice for Frieza, he's not pulling any punches. He actually does deal some good damage to Frieza, making the most of his height and power at the moment. But Frieza begins powering up. At first, his second form isn't really doing too much, but it does help close the gap. Once he goes into his third form though, things start to get a lot more even, as he eventually goes into his final form. While this fight is definitely something that they need to take note of, Goku and his group actually see an opportunity. Maybe they can use it to their advantage. Both Frieza and Vegeta are distracted, and that means the Dragon Ball is unguarded. So while this fight happens, they make sure to monitor it while also finding the last Dragon Ball. It's the perfect distraction that they needed. The two parties that they were worried about are now preoccupied, meaning they're able to get the last Dragon Ball. Although things don't go incredibly smoothly. As they're flying away, Vegeta suddenly senses them, and Frieza notices that Vegeta's acting weird and then sees what's happening. Frieza sees everyone flying away and is angered. He knows what they just did. He aims a finger in the air ready to shoot them down, leaving him open to be attacked by Vegeta. Goku tells the group to go. He'll face Frieza alongside Vegeta. He'll buy them some time while they escape. Nail agrees to join him too to make use of his power, as Gohan, Krillin, and Cargo go to summon Paranga. Frieza knocks Vegeta away and then notices two other people join the battle, Goku and Nail. He doesn't expect much of them, but he comes to see that Goku's pretty powerful, and Nail is no slouch, although he is weaker than the other two. Goku immediately goes into Wrathful, and together with Vegeta and Nail, they actually are a good challenge for Frieza, at least at his current level. Of course, he's not using his full power yet, he's just in his final form. Together, the three are able to face Frieza for a bit until he powers up some more, and they realize that he may be some trouble. Goku tries out something that he hasn't done before, at least something that he hasn't tested in a fight before. Now, he has control over Wrathful completely now, and he has Kaioken, although that's not really easy to control. It would be very risky and very strenuous to him. What if he were to combine the two? Maybe that'll give him a short boost in power that he needs to face Frieza. That's his mindset. He lunges towards Frieza and Wrathful. And just as he attacks, he activates Kyle Ken for a brief second, immediately turning it off right after. Even for that short period of time, it is incredibly strenuous to use the two together. And he can't really use Kyle Ken to his fullest because he's barely had training with it due to him focusing on Wrathful. But it does help him, despite how damaging it is to him. And the way he uses it is actually really smart. But still, even with this, it may not be enough. Thankfully though, they're only trying to distract Frieza right now, because on the other side of the planet, Krillin's group is about to summon Paranga. They're successfully able to, and since Cargo and Dende are there, they of course have a translation, being able to actually make the wishes they need. They work quickly so Frieza won't find them and get to their location. Their first wish is to revive Piccolo, and sadly this doesn't bring Piccolo right to them, so they have to use another wish to bring him there. And since they know Goku's group needs help in battle right now, they decide to send Piccolo right over to where they are. That'll be their best option, sending Piccolo straight to the fight since he offers to do that. As for the third wish, they're not so sure, but they can sense Goku and Vegeta's energy getting lower and lower. So just as soon as Piccolo joins the group, they notice that they fully get healed. Goku and Vegeta completely recover from all their injuries, same with Nail, and all that energy they lost during the battle was restored. Vegeta and Goku actually get small Zenkais from this. It's nothing huge, but it's notable enough to help during the battle, and Goku's is probably bigger due to him using Kaioken and probably injuring himself more than Vegeta was. This is good because it allows Goku and Vegeta to fight together for a short period of time without Nail and Piccolo there, because Nail pulls Piccolo aside with an idea. He tells Piccolo that if they want a chance against Frieza, they may need to fuse. Of course, this is a lot to be thrown on Piccolo at once. I mean, he just got here and now this guy's telling him that he wants to fuse together. He's hesitant, but he realizes that this guy is trustworthy, and what he's proposing may actually turn the tide of the battle. He's been put on the spot and he needs to decide quick, so reluctantly, he decides to fuse. Let's cover some power levels right now. Frieza is at 50% right now, which means his power is 60 million. But there's a catch. He's not going to be at his full capacity because of Vegeta's fight with him before. He still has injuries from that fight, and that did hold him back here. It's not going to hugely turn the tide of the battle, but it's going to be enough to make a difference. As for Goku, he's at 3 million after his Zenkai. That would mean in Wrathful he's at 30 million, and with Wrathful Kaioken times 2, that would put him at 60 million, making him even with Frieza. As for Vegeta, he's at 2 million in base, with 20 million in Wrathful. But now we have a new addition, Piccolo. Nail had his potential unlocked making him a lot stronger, which means the resulting fusion between him and Piccolo will be way stronger too. Sadly, he doesn't have any transformation or technique like Goku or Vegeta do. 
but in base, his power is 6 million, so it's still pretty big, bigger than both of them in base. And he's still going to be very helpful in battle. Collectively, they almost match Frieza in power. And with Goku and Wrathful Kaioken times 2, they actually surpass him. But remember, he can only use that for a very brief burst of power. Otherwise, he'd be able to defeat Frieza right now. And they realize now that they don't really have any other options. Goku doesn't care about damaging his body at this point. If it means they could win, he's going to go into Kaioken again, using it more than before. If he uses it quickly enough, he'll survive, and it'll allow him to get a killing blow on Frieza. But first, he needs a good distraction. Piccolo acts as this distraction, using a Makanko Sapo, hitting Frieza head-on with it. It's not strong enough to actually penetrate through him, but it's enough to continuously damage him, annoying the Emperor. Frieza struggles. He tries to deflect it away, but then on both sides of Piccolo, Goku and Vegeta appear. Vegeta launches a Gallic gun. As Goku does his Kamehameha, Frieza briefly pushes it back until Goku shouts Kaioken, times four. For this brief few seconds, his power is at 120 million, way bigger than anyone else in actually matching Frieza's full power, which he isn't at right now. He could feel his muscles being torn apart, but thankfully, he's not going to have to do this for long. Just as soon as he does this, the beam is pushed forward, completely incinerating Frieza alongside Vegeta's Gallic gun. And with this smart strategy and team up, the three of them killed Frieza together. Vegeta reluctantly joined forces with them, having no real other choice. And he is pretty pissed about the Dragon Balls. But hey, even if he couldn't get them for himself, it was an enemy of my enemy situation. They killed Frieza, so automatically, he's more aligned with them than he is with Frieza. It does leave him in kind of an odd spot though. Was that a temporary alliance or is Vegeta going to continue this alliance? Only time will tell, but it seems he's calmed down for now, despite being a little bitter. Although he did help get the kill on Frieza, so that kind of strokes his ego a bit. Sadly, Guru did die during the fight due to his stress. But once the Dragon Balls on Earth are used to revive everyone, Guru is briefly resurrected, allowing him to make Mori the new Elder, followed by him passing away once again. But this is good because now Namek has their Dragon Balls. They'll be able to revive the other fighters that are still dead, as well as moving Namek to somewhere different. Namek actually did survive this time not getting blown up, but they're still going to want to move it somewhere else just to be safe. At least they don't need to find a whole new plan. There is one interesting thing that I want to do note about Namek though, a character that'll actually be involved in the series going forward. One that I don't think I've used as a character before, at least not an important one. Now with Nail gone on Namek, there's no really strong warrior. Of course, there's a couple warrior Namekians, but no one's on Nail's level, although there is one person that wants to train to be there. Of course, Dende isn't a fighter, but his brother Cargo is actually inspired by everything. He wants to begin training, taking Nail's place as the strongest warrior there. Maybe then, they can prevent future threats like Frieza. Although, it's going to be weird training here. And actually, he has somewhere in mind to go. Nail technically still is alive, although he's living on through Piccolo, and Piccolo's on Earth. So maybe, if he ventures to Earth, Piccolo might train him, whipping him into shape as an actual warrior, being somewhat like Nail. He does have Nail's knowledge after all. So he wonders if that's an option. Dende decides to join him too. He wants to see the Earthlings again and he doesn't mind going there, and the other Namekians allow it. Sending two Namekians there won't be a problem. And even better, Dende could probably work alongside Kami, learning some stuff from him. They know Earth has a Namekian guardian. And if Dende's gonna go down the same route, it would be nice to meet someone like that. Although he doesn't plan on being guardian of Earth at all. At least not yet. So the two actually venture out to Earth, wanting to see Piccolo again. Piccolo is the strongest Namekian at the moment, and Cargo wants to see if he can do the same. Piccolo is surprised to see the two of them here, but he allows it. Although, he's going to start very far behind from where he is and where Gohan is, because Piccolo does train with Gohan and Goku a lot. But hey, these two are new friends for Gohan. They're both welcome on Earth, and Piccolo's glad to train Cargo, while Dende actually goes to see Kami. So not only are the other fighters revived, but we have someone training to be a fighter in the future. Out in space, King Cold is trying to find out what happened. He has no idea what happened with Frieza, because Frieza was dead here. And when he went to Namek, it was gone. Not blown up, it was just gone. There were no remains of Frieza, and no trace of him otherwise. It's weird, he can only assume that Frieza actually did die, because he wouldn't just disappear like this. And he wonders who actually did it. Without Frieza, he can't actually find Earth. He does plan to attack it eventually, but right now, that's not going to happen. He tries to find it though, but it's not going to be an easy task since he doesn't know who killed Frieza and where they even live. But we'll be seeing him down the line, even though he's not doing anything right now. Back on Earth, life actually continues normally. Naturally, next we'll be getting into the Android Saga, but first, we're going to cover the future timeline because things go a lot differently there. As you could probably expect, a lot already changed the scenario. But there's one key change that is actually really helpful in the future. So let's start from the beginning. Goku still dies from the heart virus, and all of my scenarios I like to assume that Goku got it from how he lives as a kid, rather than getting it from Yardrat because it was never really confirmed. So despite him not going to Yardrat, he's still going to get it here for that reason. Meaning future Goku does die. Eventually the androids do show up. 
and as you'd expect, a lot of that goes normally. Vegeta is able to put up a much better fight due to having Wrathful, but even then, it's not enough to even face one of the androids alone, much less two of them. He buys some time though. Most of the other fighters end up dying. Piccolo, Yamcha, Tenshinhan, and eventually Vegeta too, but one of them actually ends up escaping that didn't before. Due to Vegeta buying him some time, Krillin's actually able to make it out of there, helping Gohan out of the area too. Plus, Cargo never actually joined the fight. Piccolo thought it was too much for him and wanted to keep him safe. So while they're not all incredibly strong, we have three fighters left. Future Gohan, Future Krillin, and Future Cargo. And when Piccolo died, Kami died too, with the androids eventually finding the lookout and attacking him. But before that happened, everyone had a good idea. They made sure to save Dende as well, reuniting him with Cargo once more. Luckily, he's learned enough from Kami, and Kami actually kind of expected this. So they actually had some good preparations in mind. Their idea was to have Dende become the Guardian of Earth if anything happened to Piccolo, which would cause Kami to die as well. Dende is now the new Guardian of Earth, and he's going to be a really helpful asset. Not only can he heal everyone, but he can make new Dragon Balls and a new Shenron. Meaning that there is still some hope for this timeline. This gets everybody's hopes up. It's too bad because they can't revive everyone since they already died once, but with the Dragon Balls, they could actually go to Namek and possibly wish for that again. Goku would remain dead, but if they were to get to Namek, they could revive Vegeta, Piccolo, and everyone else. All they need to do is to get the Dragon Balls here on Earth. The issue is though, well, Shenron never died. Kami's plan was good, but there was one mistake. Instead of having Dende make a new Shenron, he passed on the old Shenron to him. This may not seem like a big deal, but that means that they don't have the Dragon Balls on hand. It means they're still scattered across Earth. Which is kind of an issue, because that means that they'll have to collect the Dragon Balls again. As long as they're covert about it, it should be okay, but the androids are always watching. This causes an issue later on. One day, Gohan and Krillin go out to find one of the Dragon Balls. However, it seems that they ran into some bad luck, because the androids were watching and followed Gohan and Krillin. They're curious as to where the two were going. Luckily, Gohan and Krillin do notice this and are able to escape, hiding from the androids nearby. The issue is, this leads the androids right to where the Dragon Ball is too. Gohan or Krillin could jump out from hiding and try and grab it but that would be very risky because the androids could kill them. And the androids are actually the ones to find the Dragon Ball. They notice it nearby. And with what they know from Jiro, they realize what it is. They're surprised to have found one of them. Of course, they don't know how to find more, but they realize this is probably why Gohan and Krillin came here. So if Gohan and Krillin don't come out of hiding, they'll just take the Dragon Ball for themselves and leave, even if they don't really need it. And who knows, maybe they can end up finding more, getting their own wish. The best option right now is Gohan and Krillin hiding. And the androids eventually do leave with the Dragon Ball. The good thing is that the Dragon Balls are still out there, but the androids have one of them and they need to get that from them if they want any wish. It's a shame because their plan was going so well, but they're still optimistic. Gohan promises to fix everything, and Krillin agrees. They need to get stronger now. They don't even need to be strong enough to kill the androids, they just need to be strong enough to get the Dragon Ball and get out of there. As long as they get that single Dragon Ball from the androids, they'll be fine. They check if Dende can kill this dragon and create another one. Maybe he can just destroy the statue, right? Well, there's an issue. They don't actually have the Shenron statue with them. It's still at the lookout. Thankfully, it didn't get destroyed alongside the lookout. The lookout only got partially destroyed. The fact that the Dragon Ball still exists means that the statue is intact, meaning Shenron is still intact. But without access to the Dragon Ball themselves or the statue, it's going to be a bit tough for Dende to make a new Shenron. It's going to actually take some time. Little side note here, I could realistically just give them the Dragon Balls. But I feel doing it this way makes it more interesting. I mean, if they just made a new Shenron, that wouldn't really be too fun. So uh, yeah, full transparency, sorry if my reasoning is a little convoluted, but I just wanted to spice the story up a bit more. Trust me, I realize it's kind of convoluted too, but just, pre just pretend it's good, just pretend it's okay. Give me this one thing, I just want to have some fun with the future timeline. We're all pals here, right? Just, just pretend it works. Little tangent aside, now they have a new task. The group needs to get stronger, or find a way to get the Dragon Balls for themselves. But also there is another option, Bulma's working on a time machine. It's going to take a while to complete, but if they actually use that, they can just go back to the past and hopefully restore things that way. And to be fair, even if they do get the Dragon Balls, they won't be able to revive Goku, but with a time machine, they could cure him in the past and possibly revive him that way. Getting the Dragon Balls themselves may be hard. The safest bet right now is to train, so Gohan, Krillin, and Cargo all get to work. If they train enough, they can get the Dragon Balls. And maybe if they're lucky, they could get strong enough to defeat the androids, although it would be tough. But Gohan has a goal for himself. If he learns to use that same wrathful power that Goku and Vegeta had, he could potentially get really strong, especially with his anger, and his potential as a hybrid Saiyan. He wants to make everything right. Even if he can't bring Goku back, he wants to at least fix everything else, defeating the androids, bringing back his other friends, bringing back everyone else that was killed. His mind is set to it. He feels he, Krillin, and Karugo can do this. And while Dende may not have the resources to make Dragon Balls right now, his ability to heal will be particularly useful for them. Things may seem grim now, but there's hope. 
Gohan, Krillin, and Cargo continue their training. Gohan's aiming to get the Wrathful form for himself, but it's a bit tough. Krillin believes he can do it though, as long as they keep training, they should have enough strength to get away with getting a Dragon Ball. After a few months of training, Gohan's actually able to access it. Not to mention, Krillin and Cargo are a lot stronger too. They can't fight the androids right now, but this power makes them confident enough to go and find a Dragon Ball. So, the three of them head out looking for it. They have a Dragon Radar after all, so it shouldn't be too tough. They're actually able to do this pretty peacefully. There's no issues this time. They don't encounter the androids, and they find the Dragon Ball that they need. It's almost too quiet in a way, but it should be fine. They head back to their base ready to spread the good news. But as they get closer to the hideout, they notice something's wrong. The ground nearby is shaking, and in the distance, they hear explosions. They rush over to their base, and there they see what's happening. The entire building is destroyed and they see a small barrier nearby. Dende, Bulma, and Trunks are left behind, and the androids were able to find them. They've actually been watching for a while, waiting for a good moment to strike, and they're glad to see Gohan, Krillin, and Cargo have returned. Dende struggles to keep a barrier up to protect Bulma and Trunks, but with a single beam, Android 17 launches an attack that goes right through the barrier, hitting Dende directly. They go for Bulma and Trunks next, but the three fighters intervene, trying to do whatever they can. Trying to keep a low profile, Cargo hands the Dragon Ball over to Bulma, telling her to escape with Trunks. Right now the three are on the defensive, with Gohan using his wrathful form, but even with this, it's not enough. One of the androids alone is more than enough to take out all three of them, but the androids are willing to make this fun and try and play a game, prolonging the death of these three fighters. Injured, Dende's laying on the ground, and telepathically he tells Cargo to come over to him. He doesn't think he's gonna make it, and he apologizes to his brother, but he has a better idea. Gohan and Krillin try and fend off the androids, trying to distract them in any way possible, they then notice a huge surge in power as Cargo jumps back in the fight, looking both serious and sad. He's actually way stronger than either of them now. Dende was hoping this could defeat the androids. On his deathbed, he decided to fuse into Cargo. It does give a nice power boost, but it's only enough to help hold the androids off for now. It becomes apparent to the three of them that there's no way out of this. Likely, they're all gonna die. But Krillin thinks there's another way out. He tells Gohan and Cargo to leave immediately. He's got a plan that may save them. He tells them not to argue about it either. Just do what he says because it's their only hope at surviving. They're wondering what he means, but then Krillin launches a solar flip. He tells them now's their chance, as the three of them all fly away. The androids' visions start to clear up, and although those three fighters got a head start, they have a relative idea of where the fighters went off to, at least the general direction. Krillin was hoping this wouldn't happen, but he looks back and sees the androids following him. He tells Gohan and Cargo to continue flying as he then flies backwards toward the androids. The two cyborgs see him, and once again, Krillin blinds the two of them. Gohan and Cargo continue flying, wondering what Krillin's doing and hoping he's okay. But they begin to sense him fighting. Krillin is risking his life, fending off the androids so the two others can escape. There is no other way out of this. And he knows the two other fighters are much stronger than him. If they die, then Earth has no chance at all. But Krillin can prevent that. Gohan and Cargo continue flying, thankfully being able to locate Bulma. They wait around, hoping that Krillin will show up soon. Minutes pass, then hours. There's no sign of him at all. Gohan and Cargo try to sense his energy, but they can't. They already lost Dende today, and Gohan hopes that they didn't lose Krillin too. He waits, and in the dead of night, he goes over to where the fight happened. He keeps a low profile, and luckily the androids are long gone, but his fears are confirmed as he arrives in the area. Nearby, he sees someone laying on the ground. It's Krillin. Far away, back where Bulma and Cargo are, Cargo senses a huge surge in power somewhere, then realizing that it's Gohan. While they can't sense anything, the androids feel something from far away. The ground begins shaking, and then it suddenly stops. They brush it off as a random earthquake or something. Cargo flies over to where Gohan is, and then he sees what happened. Standing there with Krillin's body in his arms, Gohan is there crying, now with golden hair. Gohan has access to Super Saiyan. Some time passes from here on out. With Dende now gone, there's no Dragon Balls at all. Cargo tries to see if he can create some for himself, but he doesn't have the powers. Luckily, he learns that he did inherit something from Dende, the power to heal. Of course, it takes some of his energy to do it, but it's still useful especially now that they're training Trunks. Cargo has grown up by now, at least in terms of Namekian standards, as has Gohan. A few years have gone by since Krillin died. Gohan was able to access that power once more, not knowing exactly what it was, but knowing that it would be useful for him. He can now transform at will, and he assumes it's some Saiyan trick, so his big goal right now is to try and get Trunks to do it as well. But still, after all these years, they can't find a way to defeat the androids. But luckily, all this time has given them something else. Bulma was finally able to finish her time machine, and as a last shot, she can send people back in time to try and reverse everything. They give Goku the heart virus medicine and warn everyone of the androids. Trunks wants to go with them too, but they decide that it's better that he doesn't. This is a few years earlier than Trunks originally left, 
They want him to stay safe, but also staying back will protect his identity. They want to make sure no one finds out about him, because if they do, Trunks may not be born in the past timeline. But once they return after the fact, Trunks can come with them then. Gohan and Cargo go in the time machine, and they head back to the past. They don't know exactly who to go to, but nearby they send someone that should be perfect for the job. In a wasteland, they find Piccolo training with Cargo. Piccolo's confused to see these two visitors. He's never seen them before, but something looks really familiar about them. Not only does future Gohan have an outfit like Goku's, but his tail is there too. He wasn't aware of another Saiyan being here, but he gets a better look at their faces than sees. The man kind of looks like Goku. Oh great, does Goku have another brother that they didn't know about? But they introduce themselves, Gohan and Cargo. Piccolo immediately communicates with everyone telepathically, telling them to get over here right now. It's pretty fun for the two future warriors, actually. They get to meet their past selves, and they get to see the people that died before. Gohan's glad to see Goku once more, and Cargo's glad to see Dende and Piccolo. However, they can't focus on reunions. They need to warn everyone about the androids and give Goku his medicine. But there's one other thing that Gohan needs to show off, Super Saiyan. He transforms, and he tells them that he doesn't exactly know what this is, but it seems like some sort of Saiyan form. Maybe the next step beyond Wrathful. He's been trying to see if he can combine the two somehow, but hasn't really found a way yet. Although, this golden hair form seems much more stable, not to mention much stronger. Vegeta immediately has the perfect theory. This might be Super Saiyan. And as a test, Goku decides to fight against Gohan. He transforms into Wrathful, and the two begin dueling. Gohan has a clear advantage. Goku even goes into Kaioken. But even with that, Gohan seems to be a bit stronger. He wins the sparring match, and the two power down. Goku's proud to see Gohan like this, and present Gohan seems to have a new goal for himself. Piccolo is also proud to see his student, although they're saddened to hear the news about everyone dying. They come to learn that the only people that survived were Cargo, Gohan, and Bulma, with Dende then fusing into Cargo, with no other option. To cause all that damage, the androids must have been pretty strong, so they don't take this warning lightly. In three years, the time travelers will all return, but for now, everyone in the past needs to train themselves, trying to get Super Saiyan for the Saiyans, while everyone else has to get stronger in their own way. The two depart, wishing everyone luck. Immediately, the Saiyans have a clear goal for themselves. Goku and Vegeta want to try and pursue Super Saiyan, as well as trying to get Gohan to do it as well. But first, they want to see if he can get Wrathful. He still hasn't gotten it yet, and according to future Gohan, it was pretty potent for him. After some training, Gohan in this timeline is able to access it too, and they figure out what future Gohan was talking about. At first, he's pretty uncontrollable, but we've seen how strong Gohan gets with Rage Boots. Combine that with Wrathful, and he'll be pretty powerful. The form seems way more potent for him than it does for even Goku and Vegeta. And while they are focused on Super Saiyan, they're not going to forget about Wrathful. They have plans for it going forward. Eventually, after some training, Goku's the first one to get Super Saiyan. And not long after, Vegeta follows too, training himself though. Gohan eventually gets it towards the end of the three years. And while they are content with Super Saiyan and realize its power, they feel that they could do better. Maybe there's even a power above this. Although, each of them has different ideas of what to do. Goku decides he wants to try and perfect Super Saiyan, wondering if he can improve the stamina and the power of it. Vegeta, on the other hand, is focused on Wrathful. Maybe he could try and do what future Gohan was doing, seeing if there was a way to combine the two forms. After testing them both out, he realized that the two powers are separate. So maybe if he's lucky, he could find a way to use the two of them at once. They keep these ideas in mind, and as for the other fighters, they see some great gains from training too. Piccolo trains with the other humans as well as Cargo. And while they may not be as strong as the Saiyans, everyone can make up for it in terms of technique. But nonetheless, they all see some great gains, and eventually the three years pass. The arc starts pretty normally. Two androids attack one of the cities, with all the fighters going over there to see what's happening. They find androids 19 and 20. And someone forgot to take his meds. Goku falls ill for the heart virus. They're able to get him out of there, as Vegeta and Gohan decide to take charge against the androids. It appears the two of them can absorb energy, and the two Saiyans are sure to keep that in mind. Vegeta goes Super Saiyan and goes up against 19, while Gohan takes charge against 20. 20 seems like a threatening enemy, and this is one of the first few real fights for Gohan. Sure, he's been involved in battle before, but this is purely one-on-one -on -one between them. Jiro's actually kind of scared. They don't have any data on Super Saiyans, although he's not deterred. Gohan's just a kid. He can't be that strong. And it turns out he is. Gohan's able to beat 20 in a fight. And simultaneously, Vegeta kills Android 19. This explosion distracts Gohan. He turns around as Jiro stretches his arm out to try and take some energy from him. But before he's able to grab Gohan, Gohan kicks him, breaking 20's arm so he can't steal any energy. What Vegeta did is smart and he's going to take notes. He destroys Android 20's other arm as well, and is then able to defeat him. Everyone's pretty surprised. Those were the two androids that they were warned about? I mean, clearly everyone was training for them, but they didn't realize they were that strong. Or on the flip side, they didn't realize that the androids were that weak. Well, it seems like they can calm down now. Goku may have the heart virus, but he'll heal soon enough. For now, everyone heads back home. 
Not long after this though, the future warriors arrive in the pass. This time, Trunks comes along too. They look around and they can't sense any of the fighters. But they also don't see any chaos happening either. The city they go to is partially destroyed, but there's no androids in sight. So they're pretty confused right now. With no other ideas of what to do, they decide to head over to Capsule Corp to get some answers. They're able to find Vegeta and Bulma there. And thankfully they find out that Trunks was born here. As well as Vegeta and Bulma finding out that Trunks exists in the future. But that's besides the point. The future warriors want to make sure that everything is okay. Vegeta chuckles. He and Gohan kill two of the androids. They were pretty simple to kill. The three warriors are really glad to hear that. Although, it's kind of saddening because nothing changed in their timeline, meaning the two must be separate. It's a shame but they'll have to find another way to defeat the androids. Vegeta makes a pass at Kamet though, giving them a perfect way to get around the energy absorption. The three of them are pretty confused. They don't know what Vegeta's talking about. Energy absorption? Vegeta wonders why they don't know about it either. And after some explaining, they quickly come to realize the two androids here weren't the same ones from their timeline. Immediately the group gets back together, trying to figure out what happened. Future Gohan, Cargo, and Trunks are glad to see that everyone's stronger, but they're still not sure about 17 and 18. Gohan notes that the one that he killed was trying to escape. He was an old man and he was commanding the other android. After some brainstorming, everyone figures out that that may have been the guy that made the androids. Surely they have no proof yet, but it seemed like he was trying to escape to start some plan that he had. After Gohan describes him more, Bulma's able to find out that this is Dr. Jiro, and maybe they can get some more answers if they find his lab. They start searching. At first, they don't really have any luck, and it doesn't seem too pressing at the moment. The future warriors realize that maybe the androids weren't activated here yet, and the two that they killed were responsible for it. So even if they don't find the lab right away, they should be fine, right? At least, that's what they assume. They don't know that there's something else lurking about. There is another android that goes unaccounted for. Since they don't really think that there's any urgency to the situation, the search for Jero's lab isn't top priority. Instead, trying to train the future warriors is. Even though they may have not altered their timeline, maybe they can train here and try and get stronger that way. But also on their downtime, everyone can try and find the lab and get some answers. Maybe if they do find the lab, they can find another way to defeat the androids without using pure power. But in this perceived period of peacetime, some odd news appears on TV. Apparently, in some towns across the world, people are disappearing randomly. Nothing is left behind besides their clothes. And there's no explanation to these creepy disappearances. No one really knows what to make of it, but they realize they may be under attack by something else. They're not sure how else to explain all these disappearances. Of course, the creature I'm referring to is Cell. Cell still is here in this timeline. Having arrived from another timeline, he's looking for the androids just like everyone else, but surprisingly, he can't find them anywhere. Just like them, he's kind of left in the dark about the whole situation. After seeing the destruction in that one city, and finding the remains of 20 and 19, he assumes that the other androids are probably activated as well. But of course, they haven't been activated. He's just been looking around for different powers to find. In the meantime, he could try and absorb people to get some more energy. But he's slowly growing more and more impatient. He was hoping that maybe the other people would try and fight them, and during those fights they'd give up enough key for him to sense so he could find the androids that way. But there's been no fight so far. He can't find the androids anywhere. But as this time passes, he starts to get a creeping suspicion. Maybe the androids actually weren't activated yet. Surely he could have gone straight for the lab right away. He knows where it is and it wouldn't be hard. But in the moment he didn't realize that they may actually be there, in the most obvious spot. And that would also explain why he senses the fighters swarming around that general area. Maybe they're looking for the lab because the androids are actually still there. He can't believe he's been so stupid. All he has to do is head over there, and he'll finally achieve perfection. Chuckling, Selden rushes over to the lab. No one actually knows where the androids were. He's the only one who actually knows the location of the lab. Everyone right now is just searching aimlessly, but he knows, he knows exactly where to go. So it's a pretty simple task for him, all he has to do is go over to the lab. He immediately starts rushing over there, not wanting to risk anything, so he powers up. This means everyone else senses him, realizing that he's actually near them. They don't know what this power is, but it's pretty terrifying, and they decide to go check it out. Of course, they're not going to catch up to him, he's so fast that he gets to the lab before they can even tell where he's going. And just as he suspected, he sees two androids there, in their pods still. As for our group of fighters, they all desperately try to find where this guy was going. They don't know who this was, but his power was really strong and somewhat familiar. It seems that he's stationary now, so they begin chasing him down, knowing his location. But as they get closer and closer, they sense two power-ups from him, scared to see what's happening. And the power is something they've never felt before. The scale of it is something that they can't even comprehend. They eventually get to the mountain where Jero's lab is, scared to even go in, not knowing what awaits them. But there's no need. Instead of them going in, someone comes out to greet them. It's a green, bug-looking man. Some sort of weird monster. He introduces himself. He's Cell, now in his perfect form. 
They don't know who he is, why he's here, or why he's so strong. But Cell begins to explain. He realizes that they might be a bit lost, so he gives a little bit of his biography. Similar to the other androids, he was created by Jero, but he's different. He begins to explain. There's no need for him to keep a secret anyways, and since they're about to die anyways, he may as well tell them. Those androids they were looking for, he was doing the same, and by going to Jero's lab, he was able to absorb them before they could kill them. So in a way, yes, the androids are dead, but Cell's now here, in his perfect form, and he's a much bigger problem. The group has no idea what to do now. This guy is an enemy, and there's no way they can defeat him. They're absolutely screwed, and there's no way out of this either. They can't escape, because Cell's got them right where he wants them. They walked right into their deaths, and Cell laughs, lifting a single hand up, charging a blast. But then, he lowers his hand. He asks where Goku is, wondering why he's not with them. He tells them not to lie either. He'll know if they're lying and he'll kill them if they do. So, they explain. Goku's sick right now. That's why he's not with the group. Since he's ill with the heart virus, he couldn't go out with them. And this gets Cell to hesitate. Hmm. Well, he wants to kill Goku, that is his main target. He wouldn't mind killing all his friends, but still. First of all, what is the point if he doesn't kill Goku too? Second of all, there's no fun in this. If he just kills them now, what's the point? He thinks a bit and decides he may as well show a bit of mercy. Cell tells the group it's their lucky day. Not only will he wait for Goku to wake up, but he'll let them train a bit, giving them some time to prepare for a tournament. Yes, a tournament. He's planning the Cell games. The whole point of this is so that he can have some fun and give them some time to train so they can get a little bit stronger. He doesn't think it'll be enough to defeat him, but it might be enough to help make the tournament more fun. And it means he gets to see Goku and fight him, which is what he really wants. So, he leaves them as is, with the group dumbfounded as he flies off. Well, that was kind of a stroke of luck, but still. They don't know how they're supposed to defeat this guy. Sure, it's great that he didn't kill them on the spot, but even if they do train for a couple days, what difference is that going to make? They're not too sure. And they begin desperately looking around the lab, trying to find a way to defeat Cell. Maybe they could find some blueprints. Maybe he has something built into him. Well, they find blueprints for Android 17 and 18, which could be helpful for the future warriors, assuming they survive and are able to go back to their timeline. If they use this, they can blow up the androids there but it won't really help here. They keep looking around and find out that there's actually another android. And he's not a cyborg like the other two from the future timeline. No, he's actually a full robot. Weird, but whatever. They decide to destroy him right away, until Krillin jumps in front of them. Maybe instead, they could reprogram him. They're asking why not destroy him right now, and Krillin explains, if they take this guy to Bulma, maybe they can reprogram the android. I mean, he is a full robot after all, and they have all his blueprints and everything else. Bulma could probably work something out from it. If she was able to make a time machine in the future from some scraps, she should be able to reverse engineer an android and reprogram him, especially since he's a full robot and not a cyborg like the other two. That might actually work, so they decide to take Krillin's word for it, taking Android 16 to Bulma's place. This guy might actually be pretty strong, and if they reprogram him, they have another fighter. That could really help them out a lot. Plus, Goku ends up waking up right after, and they have to catch him up to speed. He's a bit concerned, but also interested. This sounds like it could be some fun, and they wonder why he's so calm about it. He tells them, even if they only have a few days, he knows a way to get a year's worth of training within one day. They don't know what he's talking about, but he explains. The room of spirit and time. If everyone goes in to train, well, they may actually have a chance. He doesn't know for sure, but it's at least worth a shot. And now, it's time to group up the fighters. They're trying to decide who goes in when, and who goes in with who. And with them doing that, I feel like it would go like this. First, Vegeta and Trunks would want to go in together, going in for a year. Goku would then go in with the two Gohans. This would mean they'd have less food for a year, so they'd only be in for about 8 months, but Goku thinks that's enough, especially since they'd have an extra training partner with them. Right after them, Piccolo and the two Cargos would go in. Unlike the Saiyans, food isn't a problem with Namekians. As long as they have enough water, the three Namekians can be in there for a year and they won't need to eat at all. So they won't have to shorten their time in the time chamber. And you know, this actually makes the group a bit more confident. They have their strongest fighters training for at least a year. Well, not Goku and the two Gohans, but everyone else will be training. Plus, it kills two birds with one stone. With the future warriors training, that means they'll be stronger when they go back. Sure, they do have the self-destruct remote now as a backup plan. But this training also means they could fend off the androids in the future with pure strength. That remains to be seen though. First, they'll actually need to train. As for Vegeta, he sticks with what he wanted to do in the last part, trying to improve Wrathful somehow. Planning on combining it with Super Saiyan. During their training, he and Trunks begin working on that. As of now, Super Saiyan's pretty strong. The issue is, they only just learned about it. They have access to it, but they realize it's very draining on stamina. As for Wrathful though, it is a weaker form, but it's a lot less taxing on the body. Vegeta and Trunks spend some of their time trying to get a better grasp on Super Saiyan. 
not really going on the path of mastering it, but just getting good enough with it so it doesn't take up as much stamina. Really, their main focus is trying to combine the two forms. Vegeta believes that maybe they could combine the power of Wrathful and Super Saiyan together. He's not sure what would happen if they do, but he knows it'll be strong, if it's possible. But in order to do that, they may have to go backwards a bit, going to Great Ape instead of trying to use Wrathful. They are pretty good with Wrathful now, well, mainly Vegeta is, Trunks is still learning it, but either way they have a good grasp on it. But as for Great Ape, it's a lot easier for them to control, since it's basically the first thing that they've been working with. Now that I mention it, would Trunks' Great Ape be like, purple or something? Like, I mean, I'm sure there's gonna be someone in the comments asking me to make it purple. So you know what? I'm predicting right now. For the one guy in the comments that's gonna request a purple Great Ape, here you go. I'll do it just for you. You're welcome, and now you owe me a favor. Anyways, the two of them begin training with this, trying to combine it with Super Saiyan somehow. And over the next year, they both get a lot stronger. Next, Goku and the two Gohans go in. Instead of working on trying to combine the two forms, they're working purely on Super Saiyan, seeing if they can control that somehow. Even though they only have 8 months as opposed to a year, they can still make really good use of it. Future Gohan has more knowledge of Super Saiyan than anyone, and with Goku's great mind for battle, they can come up with some really good techniques, allowing them to develop Super Saiyan a lot faster. This works for both the Gohans and Goku. Eventually, the three of them are able to master the form, using it without any stamina loss at all. Sure, Vegeta and Trunks may be able to combine the two forms, combining Super Saiyan with Great Ape, and it is pretty strong, but Goku feels that controlling Super Saiyan may be better. They'll have to wait until the fight with Cell though, they'll see then which one is truly superior. Next, the two Cargos go in with Piccolo. A lot of the time is spent focusing on present Cargo. Piccolo sees the great potential in future Cargo, and decides it's good to get an early start with this one. I'll also say that Cargo probably won't grow up just yet. Even with the year in the time chamber, it's still gonna take a bit of time. You'll see an aged up version of present Cargo in the next part though, but for this part, he's gonna remain small. Although still pretty powerful. Anyways, they get really strong with their training too. But Piccolo will probably be a little bit weaker than he was in the main series, because he hasn't fused the Kami yet. Without the androids running around, they didn't really see any need to. But maybe now with Cell here, Kami feels it's a good time to fuse. Plus, they have Dende just in case. He's had more than enough training and he could be Earth's Guardian with no issues. Kami knows his time will come soon anyways. He's getting really old and this is the best thing he could do. He hopes Piccolo uses this power and wisdom well, as the two fuse into each other, reuniting once more. And now, it seems like everyone's ready for the Cell games. They have a few more days, so some of them rest and some of them continue their training. But otherwise, they're all ready. The Cell games arrive, and the first person to actually face off against Cell is Vegeta. He's really confident about his strategy, and immediately, he throws up an artificial moon. Ah, Cell knows exactly what this is. How primitive. He's gonna be using his Great Ape form? Shouldn't he be using that Wrathful form that they've been using? Or better yet, whatever that Golden Hair form is? Ah, whatever. This'll just make it easier for Cell. Funny enough, Cell could probably access that power too, but he thinks it's kind of useless at this point. Keep this in mind though. Vegeta looks up at the moon, and instead of going into Wrathful, he goes right into Great Ape. Cell chuckles. Doesn't this also make Vegeta a bigger target? What a stupid mistake. But Vegeta also laughs at this notion, as he then begins powering up while in his Great Ape state. The entire arena begins shaking, as the brown fur on Vegeta changes to gold. He's become a golden Great Ape. Impressing everyone there, this is a huge boost in power. Vegeta doesn't have perfect control over it, but it's still really strong, and it could be helpful. Also, it does make him a bigger target, but still, he feels the power is more than enough. It took him a while to get the hang of this. He was able to access it pretty early on, but gaining control was the real hard part. But it doesn't matter though, he goes right into battle with Cell. Of course, with Vegeta being such a big target, Cell's able to land hits on him really easily, but when Vegeta lands a hit, it's devastating, slamming a fist down onto Cell, kicking him, whacking him with his tail. Vegeta's attacks land really easily too, and that's just his melee attacks. His beams are huge now, not to mention much stronger. Cell's able to regenerate, but he does take a lot of damage from this. He didn't expect Vegeta of all people to be this strong. Sure, he knew he was a formidable opponent, but not like this. Fine, he may as well even the playing field a little bit. And with the artificial moon still up in the air, Cell looks up at it, trying to access that same anger that they use in their wrathful form. Since they have it, he should have it too, and he does. Vegeta is kind of pissing him off after all, so he may as well make some good use of that anger. He tries to tap into the Wrathful form, powering up as he does so. He doesn't change much physically, the only noticeable difference is his eyes, but other than that, he's grown a lot stronger. And that's how they know it actually worked. This actually makes the fight a lot more even. And with Vegeta's massive size, Cell is able to kind of overcome him. And while this form is kind of hard to control, 
We know that Cell can learn remarkably fast. I mean, you saw what he did with instant transmission. He'd probably do the same here, learning how to control the form really quickly, getting better during battle. Using this, he decides to weaken Vegeta, going right for his tail. He chops off the tail, succeeding in it. Vegeta powers down, going back into his regular form. Without a tail, he can't go into Great Ape, meaning he can't use his Golden Great Ape. This makes him a lot weaker, and Cell knocks him out with one hit. He's pretty injured, but still alright. As long as no one's stronger than Vegeta, he'll be okay. The next one to fight him is Goku, in Mastered Super Saiyan. Goku is a bit concerned, but still feels like he can do some damage. If not, there's always Gohan, who does seem to have a lot of potential in this battle. Maybe he'll be the one to defeat Cell, but Goku gives it his all, trying to fight all out. And while Mastered Super Saiyan is pretty strong, he begins thinking during the fight. Vegeta is on a good path. Combining Super Saiyan with Great Ape was really helpful. Goku's losing ground really quickly. With Cell's new power-up, he's a lot stronger. He would have been stronger against Goku anyways, but this makes the gap even wider. Goku's thinking on his feet, and decides maybe he can try what Vegeta was doing. The thing that Vegeta didn't have was mastery over Super Saiyan. He did have mastery over the Great Ape form and Wrathful, but Super Saiyan is a different thing. Goku has an advantage. He has mastery over both forms, and that might help him. Although, he doesn't really know how to combine the two. If he goes into Golden Great Ape, he may lose all control. But whatever, it's worth the risk. He's pushed to his limit by Cell. As Goku then transforms too, going into the same Golden Great Ape form that Vegeta was using, Cell looks up, pretty happy to see this. Just like Vegeta, this will be interesting to fight. Or at least he assumes so. He notices that Goku doesn't have control. Unlike Vegeta, Goku's just rampaging randomly. But still, he's in there somewhere, trying to regain control, trying to stop this rampage. He begins getting hit more and more by Cell, taking a lot of damage. But something catches his eye. He sees the two Gohans calling over to him, trying to make him focus. Goku was even about to attack them, just attacking blindly. But with the two Gohans distracting him, Goku finally regains some of his consciousness, overcoming the blind rampage of the Great Ape. And something changes. Instead of him being controlled like Vegeta was, he begins shrinking, no longer in his Great Ape form. They think he lost the power or something, but at least that's good. That means he'll be back to normal and they can get him out of the fight. But no, that's not the case. As he shrinks down, they see Goku there, looking very different from what he looked like before. Pushed to his limit by Cell, Goku is transformed once more, now in a new state of Super Saiyan. They're not too sure what this is, but it's definitely strong, they could tell that at least. It's the Wrathful form combined with the power of Super Saiyan. In the context of the scenario, let's call it Wrathful Super Saiyan. But to avoid any confusion, we'll refer to it as Super Saiyan 4, which is what it is. With this new power-up, Cell loses ground. Goku's incredibly powerful like this. Even Vegeta's surprised. He can't believe it. Kakarot surpassed him even though he wasn't doing the same thing. It must be because he mastered Super Saiyan and Vegeta did it. Well, at least Trunks knows now for when he goes up to fight. Or, if he goes up to fight. It doesn't really look like that because now Goku's getting the advantage. Seemingly, he might be able to defeat Cell now. Even Goku doesn't know his own power. It's amazing. All he needs to do now is land an attack that erases every bit of Cell, enough to counter the regeneration. As for Cell himself, he's faced a lot of damage and is pretty drained from regenerating so much. He's being pushed into a corner and is getting desperate. But wait, he was able to unlock the Wrathful form, right? So, maybe he could do whatever this is too. If he's backed far enough into a corner and figures out a way to do it, he may be able to. As he's being beat up more and more by Goku, Goku senses something weird. Cell has lost every bit of his sanity, brought to a point of extreme anger. And while in his new wrathful state, he begins powering up even more, trying to tap into Super Saiyan somehow. He knows it has to be in there somewhere. This pure anger, he needs to take a hold of it and use it for power. Cell begins shouting, trying to access this. Goku knows he needs to prevent this somehow. He charges a Kamehameha, ready to launch it right at Cell. Whatever Cell is doing, it's working. His power is rising, and he's on the cusp of doing something new. Goku needs to end this quick. He launches the Kamehameha, and makes a direct hit on Cell. The power of it is insane and this should be the end of the fight, right? Well, Cell was able to survive, and as the blast dissipates, they're terrified at what they see. Cell keeps powering up more and more, utilizing his own anger. Goku and the others watch horrified. There's no way he's actually gonna be able to do it. He's, he's using the same power that Goku has, and he begins undergoing a change, somewhat similar to what Goku had, but also very different considering Cell's body. He finishes morphing, and a new Cell is revealed. Even though he was perfect before, it seems he's ascended past that somehow, building upon his own perfection, getting stronger, more powerful, more perfect. Since his body was quote unquote perfect before, he won't change too much, but there are some physical indications that he's transformed. 
he's slightly bulked up. His eyes are different. The coloration on his face and body have changed. Also, his aura is a lot more intense, changing shape and color. There's no doubt about it. He was able to pull off the stamp slump that Goku was. He's using his own version of Wrathful Super Saiyan, although his very own unique version of it. Goku looks over in awe, and before he even realizes it, he sees Cell smirk, with Cell then appearing right behind him. One punch knocks Goku away into a nearby cliff, with him jumping out of the rubble, injured and grabbing his arm. That was just one punch, how did it have that much power? Even with this new power that he's using, Cell got so strong from this, just like he expected. He goes to fight Cell, but Cell keeps tanking every hit that he takes. All key blocks, all kicks, all punches, nothing is working against him. After Goku delivers a flurry of attacks, Cell decides it's his turn, attacking Goku in response, easily turning the tide of the battle. The group is watching on, not knowing what to do. Future Cargo has an idea though, he tells Piccolo that they should all fuse. It's the only way they could win against this monster. Piccolo says they can't risk that though, Cargo needs to return to the future. If Cargo fuses into him, he'll be stuck here, they won't be able to unfuse him. But Cargo argues back, it's either that or Cell wins, and not just him either, they need the other Cargo to fuse in too. Present Cargo is not too sure what to do, but he agrees with his future self. Since they came back with him, Future Trunks and Gohan give their input too. They agree. Cargo is willingly going to sacrifice himself. It means they might be able to defeat Cell if they all fuse. There's no other way to help Goku. Piccolo is debating what to do, and reluctantly decides to agree. The two Cargos place their hands on Piccolo, and they begin powering up, ready to fuse into him. But before they do it, someone flies past them. It's Vegeta. He's flickering in and out of his wrathful state, as well as in and out of Super Saiyan, trying to use the same power that Goku's using. He catches Cell off guard with a punch. But clearly with his power, that's the only attack he's going to ever get in. His power keeps fluctuating up and down. He's trying to access this form, but he can't. Without his tail, he can't go golden grade 8. He needs to be healed first. Wrathful works, Super Saiyan works, and in his eyes, this means he may be able to achieve the form. Not in the same way as Goku, but still, it's similar. It might work. He doesn't care. He's going to try regardless. Cell swats Vegeta away, but he serves as a good distraction. As he flew by, he actually had something in his hand, a Senzu beam. He handed it over to Goku as he flew past, with Goku immediately eating it and healing. With Vegeta swatted away, he's caught by Cargo, who then heals him. He could have also gone in and healed Goku himself, but it would have been too dangerous. He most likely would have died against Cell. Being healed by Cargo means that Vegeta got a Zenkai boost, and he regrew his tail. This only makes him feel more confident. He wants to jump back into the fight, but Cargo warns him. If he goes back in, Cargo doesn't know if he can heal him again. Vegeta has too much power, and he can't restore all of that. So if Vegeta's going to go into battle, he needs to make a count. Now being healed, Goku powers up once more, lunging at Cell. But even with this boost, he still can't beat Cell. He's even the playing field a bit, but it's not enough. Cell can still regenerate, so even though Goku can deal damage to him now, it's still not enough. He needs to fully incinerate Cell before he can defeat him. Goku and Cell continue their fight, as the two cargos contemplate whether or not they could fuse into Piccolo. Goku may actually have a shot here, they're not too sure though. But Vegeta tells them not to worry, he'll help him handle this. He'll turn into a wrathful Super Saiyan no matter what, he doesn't care about the risk, he'll do it. He'll go into Golden Great Ape and control the power. Neither Goku nor Cell are making any progress, although, Cell knows he can outlast Goku, as long as he keeps this battle going for as long as he can, he'll win. The two launch towards each other and clash, with their fists hitting each other, both in the stomach, dealing even damage to the other. But with his hand still on Cell's gut, Goku launches a massive blast, leaving a hole in Cell's side. He finally landed a good hit, but Cell's obviously able to regenerate from this. Goku jumps back, ready to attack once more. But the ground starts shaking. Cell chuckles. Once again, Vegeta has turned into a golden great ape. He's not going to be able to access Wrathful Super Saiyan in the way Goku did. That obviously didn't work before. Instead, he's once more trying to master the power of Golden Great Ape. And this time, he actually does seem a little bit more controlled. He briefly does fight in this form, and Cell's able to outpace him pretty easily, with Goku still fighting Cell in the process. Vegeta serves as a nice distraction, but Cell decides he's had his fun. He goes to cut off Vegeta's tail once more, but as he does, the tail moves out of sight. Right when he was about to grab it, he looks behind him, and he sees something new. Vegeta's shrinking, and Goku looks on with a smile. He knows what just happened. Vegeta finally did it. Through his sheer determination, Vegeta is now using Wrathful Super Saiyan, finally having accomplished this goal. Although he's amazed with this power, he knows they can't waste time. They can't get sloppy anymore. He stands beside Goku, and the two prepare to defeat Cell with one final push. Together, they each charge energy in their fist, maneuvering around all of Cell's attacks and avoiding them. They hop around the area with immense speed, even flying past Cell at points and delivering stray punches and kicks. 
while continuing to charge energy in their other fist. Cell decides he's gonna go all out too. In his hands, he charges a Kamehameha. Goku and Vegeta stand back to back, their hands glowing with energy. Cell launches the blast, ready to wipe them out as well as Earth. But the two don't give in. Together, they jump towards Cell, each with their fist out. With no effort at all, they cut right through Cell's blast. No, they're not just cutting through the blast. The group watches on, and Cell's blast is being pushed back. Not only are Goku and Vegeta using their own attack, but they're turning Cell's own attack against him. With their immense combined strength, they're able to reflect Cell's Kamehameha, which injures Cell but doesn't fully erase him. He cut off the power just before it hit him. He's standing there, injured and mangled, trying desperately to regenerate himself. But Goku and Vegeta are continuing to fly towards him. This all happens in the blink of an eye, and before they even know it, the group then sees. Goku and Vegeta's fists make contact with Cell, as they tear through the android with Cell being torn in half. The two skid to a halt, quickly turning around and launching all that key that they charged up. You guys like coming up with attack names, so let's try and come up with one here. We'll refer to this combo attack as the Wrathful Rush, because I like my alliteration. With this combined effort, the blast hits Cell, erasing what little remains of him. Finally, it seems that Cell is defeated, thanks to a combined effort from these two. Out of breath, the two power down into their base, giving each other a thumbs up. This wraps things up nicely. Sadly, the future warriors and Gohan didn't really get too much time to fight, but it doesn't matter too much. The fighters from the future will get their chance once they go back to defeat the androids. And as for Gohan, well, we'll see more of him later in this episode. But let's focus on future Gohan and his pals for now. With the new strength of future Trunks, future Gohan, and future Cargo, they now know that they can defeat the androids. They say goodbye to everyone and give their thanks, as they go back to their timeline, ready to save it. But before they go and defeat the androids, they have one last thing in mind that they should do. They could use another ally. They remember from the past, there was that one android, Android 16. And maybe they could take some notes from that. If they could find Jerobe's lab here, they could find him, reprogram him, and have another fighter on their side. And they do just that. They're quickly able to find Jerobe's lab, bringing Android 16 back to Bulma, who reprograms him. Not that they need the extra firepower against the androids, but it would be nice to have him just in case. One day, 17 and 18 are destroying a city as usual, and they see three familiar figures step out, with another one beside them. They laugh. Oh great, they got a new friend, what's he gonna do? They'll just beat up these fighters like they have a million times before, and their new buddy as well. 16 then reveals who he is, and they're surprised. Another android? Weird. Why is he working with that group? Shouldn't he come join them? They should stick together after all, they're all androids. But 16 doesn't even entertain this response. He takes off both his arms and launches a Hell's Flash, instantly erasing Android 18. 17 only barely jumps out of the way, but then feels a hand on his shoulder as Cargo punches him, knocking him into Trunks who grabs him. He tells Gohan that 17 is all his, as he drop kicks the android. 17 flies up trying to escape, but as he does, Gohan outspeeds him, meeting him up in the air. And 17 then sees light below him. He looks down and sees Gohan holding a hand out right towards his stomach, with a point blank blast ready to kill him. 17 throws up a shield, but it doesn't do anything. It just traps him in there with Gohan. A massive explosion occurs in the sky, with green dust coming down from 17's barrier. Gohan killed him with one attack. And now, finally, the future is safe. And they have a new friend beside them. It all turned out perfectly. And now Gohan and Trunks can work towards their own version of Wrath of Super Saiyan. Hopefully they'll be able to find it somehow. But hey, even if they don't, they're still strong enough in Super Saiyan, which they're content about. With that happy ending, we can go back to the main timeline. I also just realized I've been calling it Wrathful Super Saiyan this whole time, even though I decided it's easier to just call it Super Saiyan 4 since that's simpler. So just a little side note, if you hear me say Wrathful Super Saiyan or Super Saiyan 4, I'm referring to the same thing. It's weird because in the universe of this scenario, Super Saiyan 4 wouldn't make sense since they don't even have Super Saiyan 2 yet, but I'll just refer to it as that for simplicity. Anyway, speaking of Super Saiyan 4, Vegeta may have it, but he doesn't have great control over it, at least not like what Goku does. Goku did different training as we saw in the Cell Saga, and that's why he accessed the form easier and quicker than Vegeta did, and seemingly had more control over it. When Vegeta uses it, it's very draining, and it takes a lot of effort to transform into. This leaves him behind Goku a bit. Even though he does get a lot stronger and has access to this form, it takes some time for him to catch up. He eventually does get some control over the form and is able to use it a lot more efficiently, but still, Goku's ahead. Gohan eventually follows up next, being able to get Super Saiyan 4 for himself. And when he uses it, surprisingly, he gets older. Weird. Super Saiyan 4 is a weird form. It changes your clothes somehow, and with Kid Goku, it was able to make him age up. So, do I have any real reason for Gohan to have the same ability? Well, 
not really. I just think it's funny. Too bad though because the joke doesn't really last since Gohan's gonna be fully grown soon anyways. But still, I find some humor in Gohan going from this to this. Well, at least he knows what he's gonna look like as an adult. Either way though, the three of them all agree on one thing. The form is amazing, regardless of how much control they each have over it. The power from it is incredible. They feel like they could defeat anyone, and the raw power outfit is almost too incredible in a way. Yeah, it may seem like they're overpowered now, but consider what arcs next, the Boo arc. And having a form this strong may actually be a double-edged sword. We'll see this as this part continues. We get into a time skip and eventually to the Boo saga. Gohan and Cargo are now older, as well as Dende too, I guess. Not to mention Goten and Trunks. As for Cargo though, his training's going pretty well. I still only have one piece of art for him, so he's still stuck in the same pose, but besides that, he's doing fine. Hopefully in the next part, he'll be able to do a different pose. Jokes aside though, his training with Piccolo is going great. The two of them are growing off each other. And as you expect, Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan have all grown stronger. But Vegeta's still a bit bitter. Kakarot is still so far ahead of him. And thanks to his hybrid potential, Gohan's catching up too. Vegeta's not too sure how to feel. Speaking of Gohan, Super Saiyan 4 would actually change the great Saiyan man. There wouldn't really be a need for an outfit when Gohan could just transform into this. I mean, look at it. This is a good enough disguise as is, so he could just transform into this and use it to fight. It's perfect. It gives him the great power he needs to serve justice, as well as giving him a disguise. He loves it. Of course, Videl is still able to catch on eventually. I mean, Gohan's the only kid in school with a tail. I want you to catch his glimpses of the great Saiyan man's face. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Thankfully, most civilians in Dragon Ball are really stupid so they don't notice this. But Videl picks up on it, which is all that really matters. Eventually, we're led into the tournament. Things go pretty smoothly, but with this being the Great Saiyan Man's disguise, that means Gohan has to enter and fight in Super Saiyan 4. It may not seem like a big deal, but this does cause problems later on. Once he's fighting Kibito, his energy gets stolen by Spopovich and Yamu. And with him being in Super Saiyan 4, as you could probably guess, they'd get a lot of energy from this. Like, way more than they got originally. Even they're surprised too, but they're able to escape. Kibito didn't realize how much power Gohan had in him. He was holding back in Super Saiyan 4, but once Gohan drew out all his power, well, it was kind of too late to stop him. Shin and Kibito realized that they screwed up. When the group finds Bobbity, the fights are actually pretty simple, as you'd expect. But there is an issue. They need to hold back as much as possible, because they don't know how much energy Bobbity actually has. Even if they give off little amounts, that'll be enough to send him over the edge, giving him just enough to revive Majin Buu. Gohan gave off way too much before. And for all they know, he's right on the edge of reviving Boo. So anything they do will be bad. And no matter how much they hold back, still, they may be giving off too much. And this issue does actually come into play. Pui Pui and Yakon are really easy to defeat, but as for Deborah, it does take a little bit more effort. And even though it's no issue for them to defeat him, well, the power that they have to give off to kill him is still more than enough to give Bobbity the power that he needs. But they can't really avoid it. Not to mention, they don't really know how much power Bobbity has anyways, and they don't realize until it's too late. They thought that they were holding back enough, but it doesn't seem that way. Killing Deborah alone gave him enough energy, and now Majin Buu is revived. But he's not really that intimidating. I mean, yeah, physically he doesn't look intimidating, but in terms of power, they're not intimidated at all. Three Super Saiyan 4s against Buu. That's more than enough. They could kill him right now if they needed, and they're prepared to do that. And Bobbity's actually kind of terrified. He knows that this will be an issue. But maybe, if he gets rid of one of them, they may be able to win. If he doesn't act quickly, they'll kill Majin Buu before he gets a chance to do anything. So he keeps Buu away from them for now, as Bobbity tries to work his magic. And then he notices the perfect target. He won't even need much effort. He knows exactly what he needs to do. He needs to possess Vegeta. Vegeta is still jealous of Kakarot's power, wanting to surpass him and beat him in a battle. And just like normal, Bobbity can exploit that, manipulating Vegeta into being evil once more. With this, we have the birth of Super Saiyan 4, Majin Vegeta, who is sent to fight Goku. Gohan is now the only one facing Buu, besides Shin and Kibito being there, as well as Cargo, Piccolo, and Krillin watching up. And Gohan actually does have enough power. He may have been able to defeat Buu alone. Three Super Saiyan 4s is overkill, but even one Super Saiyan 4 should be enough. Although there is one issue. Gohan's been transformed for so long. Remember, this is his disguise. This is how he is the great Saiyan man. He hasn't de-transformed this whole time. He's been using it all along. And due to that, he's lost some power. He can't keep this up forever. He needs to make it quick. Now with him being possessed, Vegeta is stronger. He's confident that he'll be able to defeat Goku in a fight. The two of them head off to fight on their own in order to not distract Gohan. Gohan thinks he might be able to handle Buu alone. Although, his stamina is running out like I mentioned last time. He's not sure for how much longer he'll be able to hold Super Saiyan 4. But he's the last line of defense. Goku's preoccupied with Vegeta. 
And just like Bobbity Plan, this leaves only one obstacle for Majin Buu. Goku's fight with Vegeta begins. Goku wonders why Vegeta would even let himself be possessed. He knows that he did it willingly. But Vegeta doesn't care about Kakarot's judgment. All he cares about is winning this fight. Goku's able to witness firsthand how much stronger Vegeta is. It's not huge, but it is a noticeable increase, enough to actually even the playing field a bit. If you remember from last time, I mentioned that Vegeta was a bit behind, not only in his base, but in terms of controlling Super Saiyan 4. Goku definitely did have the upper hand, but now with the Majin power boost, Vegeta is getting closer and closer to him. This fight would have been great for Bobby to collect energy. Of course, he doesn't need that now. It's only a distraction. The two are out in a wasteland, allowing them to fight all out without any distractions. Goku will give Vegeta what he wants. But he warns Vegeta, he's not going to hold back or go easy on him. Super Saiyan 4 is his ultimate power after all. And if this is the only way to get Vegeta back to normal, so be it. The two clash fists, causing a massive explosion that levels the landscape around them. They're exchanging and blocking blows left and right. But even with this power, Goku's still confident he can win. As long as he's able to hold off Vegeta, Vegeta just might de-transform, going into Super Saiyan 2 or something even lower. Goku feels that he can outlast him. Even if Vegeta gets this power boost, it won't matter if he can't use Super Saiyan 4. Speaking of running out of Super Saiyan 4, let's go back to Gohan for a bit. With Goku and Vegeta both gone, this gives Buu a chance to win. If he takes out one of the Saiyans, then he'll be able to pick off the other two pretty easily, since they're going to be pretty worn out after their fight, no matter who ends up winning. It's a perfect plan that works out for Bobbity. All Buu needs to do is defeat Gohan. And then Buu will be in the clear, the Super Saiyan 4s will no longer be a threat, and he can go around the universe destroying whatever he pleases. Gohan doesn't back down though, Super Saiyan 4 is fleeting and he knows it might disappear soon, but he's gonna make the most of it. He charges at Buu at full power, and immediately he becomes aware of Buu's abilities. It seems he can regenerate from any sort of attack, and it's not like Cell either, Buu can regenerate pretty much instantly, and it doesn't take up any of his stamina to do so. He's definitely not an average fighter, despite his childish appearance and demeanor, He's way more threatening below the surface. Gohan uses all his power, and some of the other fighters around him even join in too. Cargo, Piccolo, Krillin. They're acting as distractions so Gohan can try and charge up an attack. This actually does give him a bit of time, enough to charge up a full power Kamehameha, launching it right at Buu and getting a direct hit. It seems this attack actually does the job. When it dissipates, there's nothing left of Buu, just a crater where he once was. Bobbity looks on in shock. No way Gohan was able to manage this. But much to everyone's surprise, Buu ends up regenerating. Little pieces of him from around the area come back together, recreating Buu again. Buu is actually starting to get kind of angry from this fight. Gohan is surprisingly powerful, and the way they're all attacking him at once angers him. Not to mention the fact that he was almost destroyed by that one attack, but he tries to keep his cool as best as he can, continuing his fight with Gohan. But charging up that attack actually took out a lot of energy from Gohan, that's going to make things harder for him. He's losing more and more energy by the minute, and eventually, he drops out of Super Saiyan 4, going down a notch into Super Saiyan 2. Crap. He knew this would happen eventually, but not now. He was hoping he could hold Super Saiyan 4 for a bit longer, but whatever, he'll hold off Buu. As long as he stops Buu for long enough, Goku can come back and help defeat him. With Buu angered, he decides he wants something to eat. That might calm him down a bit. Quickly, he turns to Cargo, and from his antenna, he launches a beam, turning Cargo into a cookie. Bobbity laughs as he watches, and everyone looks on in horror as Buu eats him. This only serves to anger Gohan even more, as he then powers back up into Super Saiyan 4, using what little energy he has left giving him a little rage boost as well. He beats Buu down into the ground, actually dealing some significant damage. Of course, Buu's able to regenerate, but this only serves to make Buu even angrier, angrier than he was before. He starts fighting back, trying to hit Gohan, but Gohan's taking all the attacks. His rage is overpowering everything. But even with this rage, it's not enough. His energy is too little, and he drops back down to Super Saiyan 2, but continues fighting nonetheless. Although, Buu's anger is also starting to take effect, and eventually, it bursts out of him, literally bursting out creating evil Boo. Okay, that's gonna be an issue. There's two Boos now, apparently. No one knows exactly what happened, but they know it's not good. Although, the two Boos start fighting each other. They don't get involved, but they watch on as this happens, with Bobbity watching uninterested too. Even he's not sure what happened. The group knows that if they intervene, they might die as well. They just need to wait for Goku and Vegeta's fight to end. Although it becomes too late. Evil Boo is able to absorb good Boo, then turning into Super Boo. From far away, Goku senses this. He tries to leave his fight with Vegeta, but Vegeta wants to finish the battle. Goku keeps telling Vegeta to snap out of it. There's more important things at stake right now. They desperately need to go help Gohan and the others. But Vegeta prevents Goku from leaving. He's gonna finish this here and now. Back to Gohan and his group, they're all too weakened to fight. The next best option is to retreat. They don't know where to, but they're gonna leave. They all run over to Shin who's nearby. But Boo's not gonna let them escape. He launches two more candy beans, aimed at Goten and Trunks, but Piccolo and Krillin jump in front of them, protecting the two kids as they go off with Gohan. This only serves to anger Gohan more, but he knows he can't do anything. 
They're able to make it to Shin, who then teleports away, going to the sacred world of Kai. Boo wonders where they went, but he doesn't care. He picks up the two candies, a chocolate shaped like Piccolo, and another treat shaped like Krillin. He pops the two of them in his mouth, and surprisingly, he transforms once more, gaining Piccolo and Krillin's power. Not to mention their intelligence. Bobbity watches on amazed. Boo is so much stronger than before, and he actually seems somewhat competent now. Especially with Piccolo and Krillin absorbed, he's actually coherent, which is pretty surprising. But this does raise an issue. He still wants to control Boo, and he's not sure if he's going to listen to orders now. Bobbity tries to control him, giving him orders to try and find Goku and Vegeta to kill them next. And while Boo does want to do that, he doesn't want to follow Bobbity's orders either, so he just simply turns to the wizard and says no. Bobbity's getting angry at this. He starts threatening Boo, telling him to listen to him. He was the one to revive him after all. He should be grateful. Neither his words nor magic are strong enough to control Boo. And this only serves to anger Boo even more. And remember, Boo is actually smart now and competent. There's no way he's going to be controlled by Bobbity of all people. He controls himself. As Bobbity keeps yelling at him, Boo turns towards the wizard, holding a single hand out, using telekinesis to draw Bobbity towards him. He grabs Bobbity by his neck and turns him into candy as well, then eating him. This doesn't give him a huge boost in power, but it was a nice treat, and he does get some little magical abilities here and there, although nothing too intense, nothing that he didn't really have before. But Boo is surprised at his own transformation. All of this happened so fast. He's much stronger and smarter than before. And he's pleased with himself. Instead of being that babbling idiot that he was, the evilness inside him took control. Now there's no more annoying wizard controlling him. And with this power, no Saiyan will be a threat to him. Even better, he can just absorb those other two Saiyans. He just has to go over to where they're fighting and get them, adding to his own strength. On the sacred world of Kai's, Shin is wondering what kind of technique they could use to help them. At everyone's current strength, defeating Boo might be tough especially because he has people inside him. If they kill Boo, they also kill Cargo, Piccolo, and Krillin. They really need to figure out something quick. He has one idea though. Gohan can try and use the Z-Sword. It's going to take a bit of time, but as long as they can stall Boo somehow, it might work. And as for Goten and Trunks, well, he's not really too sure what to do with them. They're surprisingly strong on their own, but in comparison to everyone else, they're not really going to be able to do much, especially against someone like Boo. But they want to help, and Shin tries to think of what they could do. If only there was a way to make use of their two powers. Thankfully, they receive some unexpected help. King Kai ends up intervening, asking Shin to bring him there. He has something that might actually help them. He's surprised to hear King Kai intervene. He wonders what King Kai knows that could be so special. And it's not necessarily a technique of his, but it's something he knows from Otherworld. Something that Goten and Trunks might be able to learn. Fusion, a metamorphic technique that allows two people to fuse into one warrior. It'll be perfect for them too. It requires two people that are around the same size and the same strength. There's no better subject for that than Goten and Trunks. And if they fuse with their great power, they may be able to actually beat Boo. It's a long shot, but worth a try. And while all this is going on, Gohan actually surprisingly pulled out the Z-Sword. It's easier for him to do this time since he's a lot stronger, meaning he can begin training with it right away. He wants to go back to Earth as soon as possible. So once Goten and Trunks learn fusion, and once he learns to get a control over the Z-Sword, they're going to go back and try and defeat Boo that way. Back on Earth, Boo is about to go get Goku and Vegeta. But before he does, he wants to make sure he's more than strong enough to do this. So he starts going around Earth trying to eat more people. Instead of just killing them, he's actually absorbing them this time, turning them into candies and trying to get their power that way. Remember, he is smarter now after all. There's no point in killing people when he could just take their power instead. He might as well make a use of it, even if all their combined power isn't that much. As for Goku and Vegeta, their fight finally concludes. Vegeta eventually detransforms, going into Super Saiyan 2. It gives Goku the perfect opportunity to finish the fight. With a single blow, he knocks Vegeta out. And now Goku can finally go check on Boo. But it's not going to be that easy. He knows that everyone retreated already. And in terms of his own power, he's kind of worn out from his fight with Vegeta. No matter how great his control over Super Saiyan 4 is, he's not going to be able to hold it for much longer. Even regular Super Saiyan 2 or Super Saiyan would be too much. He exhausted all of his energy. He's going to need a Senzu or something. Before trying to face Boo, he's going to go to the lookout. That way he can get a Senzu bean and maybe draw out Boo's time a little longer. Since the most important thing is to bide for time right now. He brings Vegeta along with him, and they go to Korin's tower. But as he flies over, he suddenly sees beams from all directions. Lasers fall out from everywhere in the sky. Of course, Goku's able to dodge them, but he looks around wondering where they're hitting. He flies into a nearby city and sees the destruction. It seems each of those beams was directed at an individual person. Boom must have just killed the entire civilization of Earth. All of Goku's friends, the rest of his family. Anyone who couldn't have avoided that attack is now dead. He can still send some energies though. Other fighters were actually able to avoid it. At least, the fighters that were on Earth. Yamcha, Roshi, Tenshin on Chaozu. They seem to be okay, actually. As for Gohan, Goten, and Trunks, he assumes they're with Shin, even though he can't sense them. 
he makes haste and flies over to Korin's tower. And luckily there are some sensors left. He's able to get one for himself and save some for later. He's not entirely sure if he should give one to Vegeta right now, because if Vegeta wakes up and he turns out he's still evil, well that's obviously going to be an issue. Shin can deal with Vegeta first and try and reverse whatever spell is on him, unless Vegeta himself will overcome it. But as soon as he eats it, his power soars, and that lets Boo sense him. He suppresses his power as quick as possible, but it's already too late. Boo's heading over and within seconds he's right there. Goku sees that Boo looks way different than before, not just in size and shape, but also his clothes. He has Piccolo's cape on him. And within Boo, he can sense the energy of some other fighters, as well as a bunch of humans. He sees what happened now. Boo's like Cell, he absorbed people's power to get this way. But Goku tells Boo, no matter how strong he is, he's not gonna win here. Goku won't allow it. By now, about an hour or so has passed. And back on the sacred world of Kai, Gohan feels confident enough with the Z Sword. And as for Goten and Trunks, they've already failed fusion twice, but they try once more, and they get it perfectly. Shin knows that now's the time to head back to Earth and go and help Goku. Even if everyone isn't at their full potential, this is enough. They need to go and at least help. Shin grabs onto them, teleporting them over to Earth. Goku and Boo are surprised to see them there. And Goku's glad. Boo is getting too strong for him to face. This should be enough. Wait, who the hell is Gotenks actually? Gohan tells him that it's some sort of fusion thing, but they'll explain it to him later. That's not important now. All Goku learns is that it's Goten and Trunks combined. Huh, fusion. That sounds interesting. The three of them fight Boo together, using all the power that they can grasp. And Boo knows that he's outmatched right now. He needs to absorb one of them. That's his only way out of this. If he doesn't, he's gonna die right here. The three of them will kill him. Nearby, there's Shin and Vegeta. Vegeta's unconscious and he's been weakened. Of course, he will grant a lot of power, but still. And as for Shin, he's pretty weak. He won't really do much in the grand scheme of things. Boo feels that it's better to absorb one of these fighters. Gohan knows to watch out for Boo's candy beans, but he doesn't know another way that Boo can actually absorb people. Just by extending himself. During the battle, a piece of Boo is blown off and that gives him the perfect opportunity. He tries to hold them off as long as possible, sneaking that dismembered piece around them, hoping that they won't notice. And he has the perfect target for that. The most inexperienced fighter, but one who's still pretty strong. Gotenx. Gotenx suddenly feels something weird on his arm. He looks down to see pink slime on his hand. It begins extending, wrapping around his entire arm and eventually his upper body. They don't know what's happening, but then Gohan realizes. He's absorbing Gotenx. They need to stop him somehow but it's already too late. Boo has once again absorbed another person, and he's stronger than ever with Gotenks absorbed. Goku and Gohan may still have a chance though. If they work together, they may be able to do something, although it's risky. It's gonna be a hard battle, but the possibility of success is still there. But Shin doesn't want to take that chance. He talks telepathically with Goku and Gohan, telling them that they need to leave now. He has a better idea, but this is their only shot. And while the two want to fight, they end up listening to him. This fight is getting far too dangerous for them to continue, even if they may have the gap in power. Again, they're not sure how long their power will last, or if Boo has any other surprise techniques. Goku launches a solar flare at Boo, blinding him as they head over to Shin. This angers Boo, and while he's blinded, he randomly launches a galactic donut, a massive one that encompasses the entire area. He launches more and more around them, honing in on their energy and trying to grab them. Gohan tells Goku to go. He'll hold Boo up. He protects Goku from the attacks as Goku goes to Shin. Goku tells Gohan to join them quickly, but he tells Goku to go with Shin. He and Vegeta are their last hope. If he doesn't hold Boo off, Boo would just follow them and kill them there. He needs to do this, and he promises Goku that he'll be fine. Besides, he's confident enough with the Z Sword, he might actually be able to win this. And if not, he has Goku and Vegeta for reassurance. He knows Shin will help restore Vegeta somehow, and they could figure out something from there. Shin teleports away with the two other Saiyans, as Gohan lifts up his sword, preparing to face Boo once more. As Goku and Shin retreat, Gohan faces Boo Tanks alone. Gohan doesn't feel that he can defeat Boo, but that's not the point. He wants to hold him off. He wants to let Shin do whatever he has in mind. Apparently whatever he's thinking of might be really good. He's not too sure what it is, but he hopes for the best. And now gives him the perfect opportunity to test the Z Sword. While in Super Saiyan 4, Gohan attacks with the sword, having much better control over it than he did before. Boo laughs at this, but when he's hit by the sword, it actually does deal some damage. Of course he's able to regenerate from it, but still, he didn't expect the sword to be that powerful. The Z Sword actually gives Gohan more strength. The more he swings it, the stronger he's getting. Not to mention the sword itself is very durable and strong. So even without him using his key to enhance the power of it, the sword's still strong on its own. It actually seems to be a very useful weapon against Boo, and this is definitely going to be incredibly helpful in holding him off. Gohan keeps fighting, and Boo tries to work around this somehow. Whenever he attacks Gohan, Gohan simply slices him with the sword, his arm, his leg, whatever he attacks with. At this point, it's essentially a stalemate. Gohan can't hurt Boo, but Boo can't hurt Gohan. Alright, Boo's gotta stop playing around. He absorbed Gotenks for a reason. 
he's gonna become a lot stronger, and now he's gotta use that strength to his fullest. Not to mention, he is a bit concerned. Goku and Vegeta disappeared, as well as the Supreme Kai. He assumes they must have retreated, but he wonders why they left Gohan here, and then it hits him. Gohan's a distraction. He's not the main opponent. They must have retreated because they had some other idea in mind that might help. Boo can't possibly fathom what they might be scheming, but he knows it's probably not good. If they were confident enough leaving Gohan behind, that doesn't bode well for Boo. But he has his own idea. Although Gohan is wary of absorption right now, Boo thinks that he might actually have a chance at absorbing him. He doesn't need to kill Gohan. He actually does want to absorb Gohan, despite how hard that might be. But he might have an idea. He attacks Gohan more and more rapidly, causing a bunch of different pieces of Boo to be sliced off. He's purposefully letting himself get attacked like this, trying to make it seem like he's fighting sloppy, when really, this is part of his plan. Gohan then tells Boo it's pointless. No matter what attacks he throws at Gohan, they won't work. Quickly, he then swipes his arm, flinging a piece of himself at Gohan trying to absorb him. But Gohan quickly slices it in half. He tells Boo that cheap trick won't work, but then tells Gohan to look around him. More and more pieces fly towards Gohan. He tries to slice them all, but eventually some end up sticking to him. This happens more and more rapidly, and eventually he's absorbed by Boo completely, creating Buhan. Let's go to the sacred world of Kai's for a bit. Over there, Shin and Goku arrive, with an unconscious Vegeta in their hands. Goku's then shocked to see a surprise guest there, King Kai? He says he might actually have the perfect way for them to defeat Boo, although it's going to take some teamwork, so they will need Vegeta to help. They're all still wary about trusting Vegeta at the moment, but it doesn't matter, this is their only shot. So Vegeta is healed, woken up from his unconsciousness, and it seems the Majin curse he received is gone. He's snapped out of it. Vegeta's a bit confused about what just happened. He doesn't know where he is and how he got here. He was unconscious for a bit after all. So they catch him up to speed, telling him everything that's happened so far. Alright, so that still doesn't explain. Why is King Kai here and what does he have in mind for them? He tells them there's one way for them to defeat Boo, and Vegeta can't say no to it. Even though most likely Vegeta probably will say that. He tells Vegeta that the two of them need a fuse. He and Goku. Wait, fuse like Gotenks did? How are they supposed to do that? They don't know the fusion dance. Well, King Kai tells him that he was the one to show Goten and Trunks the dance after all. So who better to learn from than him? But how are they supposed to learn it in such a short time? They're way more crunch for time than Goten and Trunks were. Plus, when he mentions the fact that fusions can fail if they do it wrong, that only serves to make them more nervous. But he tells them they have no other choice. Either they do this, or they try and fight Boo and just die as is. At the current rate they're going at, Gohan is going to be defeated by Boo, either killed or absorbed by him. Both of which are bad outcomes, but the latter is even worse. If Boo gets stronger, then they're really screwed. They at least need to try the fusion, even if it does come with that risk. Plus, it's not like they're going to be fused forever. Obviously, they don't know the Patara at this point. So it's not like Vegeta's going to decline because he doesn't want to be fused forever. The two of them realize that they only have one shot to get the fusion right. King Kai and Shin show them the dance. And Goku and Vegeta practice a few times first. Not trying to actually fuse, but trying to just get the positions right. Vegeta feels kind of foolish doing it, but Goku kind of likes the dance. And after a few tries, it seems like they're able to do it from memory, without screwing up the finger formations or anything. They just need to hope that when they actually do try fusion for real, it's going to work. So the two of them pray to Kami as they perform the fusion dance, knowing that everything hinges on this. This is really their only shot, putting a lot of pressure on them. Kenkai watches on nervously, even sweating. A bright light appears in front of him as the two fuse. This needs to work. He's hoping that it does, and his anxiety disappears. As the light dissipates, he sees a perfect fusion right in front of him. It definitely worked. Goku and Vegeta have now fused, turning into a brand new fighter. Well, Gotenks has a cool name, so he may as well come up with one too. How about Gogeta? Yeah, that's fitting. With no time left to waste, the two of them are taken back to Earth. As they arrive, Shin tells them that Gohan was just absorbed from what he could sense. So it won't be as easy. Gogeta was so focused on the fusion that he didn't even notice this, but he expected it to be the case. So not only are the two of them stronger, but Boo got stronger as well. Gogeta quickly heads over towards the area where he senses Boo, and Boo's surprised. What is this new energy heading towards him? The fighter stops in front of him, and Boo can't really recognize him. It looks kind of like Vegeta, but also kind of like Goku. And then he sees the clothes. Oh, that's what happened. The two of them fused, creating a new fighter. So it is just like Gotenks. He wonders how strong this fusion will be, but it doesn't matter anyways. Now that he has Gohan absorbed, he feels more than confident enough that he can defeat them, and a battle between the two begins. Gogeta fights starting in base, trying to gauge Boo's current power, as well as pacing himself. He knows he might screw up the fusion if he powers up too much, so it's also pretty ideal for that reason. However, there is one difference with Gogeta. He has a much better control over Super Saiyan 4 by now. Both Goku and Vegeta have learned to use it better and better, 
and with both of their minds working together, Gogeta knows that once he transforms, he'll be able to hold it, so they could make it work. He fights in base for a bit, and realizes that he's not really getting anywhere, he has a good gauge for Boo's power. And really, he was just doing this to test the waters. The real fight begins now, Gogeta begins powering up, energy appears around him, generating massive gusts of wind. This wind is so powerful that it even knocks Boo back, destroying the ground and mountains nearby. Boo has a hand in front of his face trying to block it out, while also trying to look on and see what's happening. This power, it's so intense, he never expected something like this. He knows the two of them fusing got stronger that way, but this? This is insane! Gogeta shouts. Fur appears on his body, and his hair begins growing. Weird, for some reason it turns red. Not like other Super Saiyan 4s where his hair is black. The aura around him dissipates, and he stands there calm, looking on towards Boo. Gogeta has now transformed into Super Saiyan 4. Buhan tries to remain confident though. Even though this power is intense, he won't give up. His own power should be sufficient. His own power plus whoever's in him, that's more than enough. This is only a minor setback. Yeah, that's what it is. It'll just delay their death even longer. But he tells Gogeta it's a shame. This is both his first and his last battle. As the two fighters in class with each other. On the sacred roll of Kai's, all the Kai's watch on. Thanks to Kinkai helping them watch it. This is insane. Boo is definitely terrifying, but Gogeta? Well, in simplest terms, it's pretty good that he's on their side because he's also really scary. They knew his Super Saiyan 4 fusion would be incredible, but this is just something else. They also wonder why his hair's red. That's kind of weird, but... Not really the most important thing right now. They watch as the two fighters clash. Gogeta is casually able to outpace Boo. Every attack from Gogeta is so potent that Boo can't even regenerate fast enough. And whenever he attacks Gogeta, his attacks pretty much accomplish nothing. The gap in power is immeasurable. Boo is getting more and more desperate. And even though Gogeta could defeat him really easily right now, he doesn't want to do that. And this isn't him wanting to have a good fight or anything. It's more so because he's concerned about the fighters inside of Boo. If he kills Boo, then he kills those people in him. So before going to that option, Gogeta wants to see if he can find some way to get them out of there. But then he notices something interesting. The Z-Sword is discarded on the ground nearby. When Gohan was absorbed, Boo never took the sword. Gohan just dropped it, and this might actually have some use for Gogeta. Faster than Boo can even process, Gogeta rushes to get the sword and then comes back, slicing Boo in half. Hmm, okay. Gogeta observes the damage expecting that Gohan and Gotenks would come out of his body somehow. He thought by slicing Boo in half, he'd see inside him, as gross as it sounds. But they're nowhere to be found. Okay, maybe he has to slice Boo some more. Gogeta haphazardly swings the Z-Sword, slicing faster and faster than Boo could even react to. Alright, none of that's working. This must have something to do with Boo's magic. So he's just gonna have to buy some more time, overwhelming Boo as much as possible as he tries to think of any other options he has. He drops the Z-Sword, with Shin shivering as he watches this. So disrespectful. With all of Boo's pieces scattered about, Gogeta jumps up in the air, then launching a bunch of key blasts from the sky, performing a Stardust Fall. This isn't aiming to kill Boo, more so just to annoy him, delaying his regeneration even more. And then, Gogeta gets the perfect idea. So, as we've seen, Gogeta has some really weird ability where he can control negative energy and reverse it. We saw this in Fusion Reborn, and we saw it in GT. I know, I know. Both of those are non-canon. But, dude, come on. This is a what if, none of this is canon, so I could take ideas from whatever. I mean, look, it's Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta. The whole point of what ifs is that I'm not sticking to canon. Gogeta feels like he has the perfect way to save everyone inside of Boo while still destroying the Majin. Boo regenerates, finally in one piece again. He looks around, his eyes are darting everywhere. He's actually kind of scared, he can't see Gogeta anywhere. But then he feels a tap on his shoulder. He turns around, and no one's there. And behind him, he hears a shout. Gogeta's there with a blue ball of energy in front of him as he shouts Big Bang Kamehameha. But this isn't any normal Big Bang Kamehameha. I mean, I know that attack isn't really normal to begin with, but Gogeta's tweaked this. He made this attack only able to target negative energy. He's hoping that by putting all his power into this, it'll erase all the negative parts of Boo while leaving everyone inside of him intact. And as for the attack itself, well, it's pretty much beyond comprehension. The Kai's watch on in awe, and within an instant, Boo is completely erased. And it worked just as Gogeta planned. On the ground in front of them, all the absorbed fighters are there. But strangely enough, there's another Majin Buu there. That was the good one from before that got absorbed by Evil Buu. Oh, he seems like he might actually be a good person after all. And even if he wasn't, well, that attack is supposed to destroy any negative energy within someone, so maybe they can keep him alive. And it's perfect timing too, because by now, Gogeta's used so much energy that he finally defuses. It seems things worked out really well in the end. And fusing together was actually kind of fun for both the Saiyans. They are pretty amazed with Gogeta's power. And it's good that they have this power, because soon enough, another character is about to arrive. We go into a little bit of a time skip as we then go to Battle of Gods. And like normal, Beerus would eventually wake up. 
When you think about it, not really much is going to change here. Beerus wakes up, heads to Earth trying to find the Super Saiyan God, and even with all the different events in the scenario, nothing really changes. And it seems he's in the right place. Of course, not everyone here is Saiyans, there's a lot of Earthlings, but he can tell. There's random people with tails around here. Those guys are definitely Saiyans, they have to be. Oh, and there's Vegeta. Weird seeing him here, but whatever. Beerus is looking for the Super Saiyan God, and they say they have no idea what that is. They do have Super Saiyan and they have some forms beyond that, but the Super Saiyan God? No, they never heard of it. It sounds cool though. They're willing to fight Beerus to show him their power, and maybe that way they'll actually find out what it is. For all they know, Super Saiyan 4 might actually be that Super Saiyan God Beerus is talking about. I mean, it is a pretty godly form. Not in the literal sense where they're deities, just it's so overpowered that it might be what Beerus is looking for. Goten and Trunks want to join too, but they still don't have access to Super Saiyan 4. But trust me, they're working towards it, and once they get it, they're going to have that same effect that Kid Goku had where he ages up. So don't be concerned about me giving them some weird design where they're still kids with Super Saiyan 4. But anyways, we're not doing that in this part. For now, it's just Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan fighting Beerus in Super Saiyan 4. And in all honesty, he finds the power from these Saiyans impressive. Of course, they're nothing compared to him, but still. No wonder they were able to defeat threats like Majin Buu and Frieza. Goku interrupts Beerus. He forgot to mention Cell. Who's Cell? A bio-android? Earth is a really weird place. I mean, we are witnessing three monkeys fight a Catman. So a bio-android isn't really the weirdest thing here. Tangent aside, nothing that they do works. But Goku and Vegeta have an idea. They could bring out Gogeta once more. Quickly, they fuse, with Beerus watching on impressed. Ah, fusion. This might actually make things pretty fun. Right off the bat, Gogeta's in Super Saiyan 4. And the boost in power is huge, although it's not really enough to phase Beerus. He is impressed still, and this gives him a good taste of what Saiyans are capable of, although this fusion still isn't enough to defeat him. He is satisfied though. Earth had some pretty strong fighters, and he got some nice food here, so he's not too sad on getting Super Saiyan God right now. But the Saiyans do show promise. They're probably not going to find out right away, but if they want to come to Beerus' planet, they can try working towards Super Saiyan God. Of course, Gohan can't leave Earth because he has responsibilities here, and Goten and Trunks are too young and also have their own responsibilities. They'll keep up with their training, of course, but as for Goku and Vegeta, they accept this offer to go to Beerus' planet. Whatever this Super Saiyan God thing is, it sounds interesting, and immediately the two of them are excited. Super Saiyan God apparently is supposed to be stronger than Super Saiyan 4. They would have never expected something like that. But even more interesting, it's the prospect that they could probably combine it with Super Saiyan 4 somehow. I mean, think about it. Super Saiyan 4 is just Super Saiyan combined with Great Ape. So who knows, what if they try to combine Super Saiyan God with Great Ape, or Super Saiyan with Super Saiyan God, or even better, all three of them at once. They got so many ideas in their mind. But of course, before they do any of that, they actually have to find out what a Super Saiyan God even is. The training begins. With the end of the last part, we saw Goku and Vegeta go to Beerus' planet so they could train with Whis, getting new levels of Super Saiyan God and possibly things beyond them. But before we talk about them, I actually do want to talk about the people on Earth, specifically Piccolo, Gohan, and Karga. Naturally, the three of them are still training together, and they each have their own goals of what to work towards. For one, Cargo is now mentoring Goten and Trunks. Piccolo feels that this will be a better experience for him. Piccolo spent a lot of time teaching Cargo, and he wants to see how he would perform as a teacher. After all, Cargo is growing at a pretty impressive rate, and Goten and Trunks want to keep training themselves as well. And with Cargo's previous growth, that of course would rub off on Piccolo. He spent a lot of time teaching Cargo, so on top of his own training, this is going to give him some more experience. He learned some new things that he didn't even know before as he further augments his own techniques and powers. I haven't talked about the two of them much, but as you expect, the two of them are a really strong duo, and they're a really strong trio once you get Gohan involved, who spends a lot of time with them. They're both Piccolo students, and in a way, Goten and Trunks are kinda Piccolo students by extension, so Piccolo inadvertently started his own school of sorts with four students right now. Weird how this guy was Goku's arch enemy not too long ago. Each of them continue on their own, motivated to get stronger just like usual. Goku and Vegeta on the other hand are on Beerus' planet as I mentioned. They're growing at a pretty impressive rate. After getting Super Saiyan God, they begin practicing with that until they can go beyond it somehow. Like I mentioned in the last part, they're just going to apply the principles of Super Saiyan 4 to it. They combine Wrathful and Super Saiyan to create Wrathful Super Saiyan, which I just call Super Saiyan 4 for simplicity. So maybe they can combine Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan God, and eventually they do combine the two powers of those, creating Super Saiyan Blue. Super Saiyan Blue is a pretty amazing form for them, and it's definitely their strongest form at the moment. But even with that, they know this isn't their limit. They want to go even beyond Super Saiyan Blue already. Trying to combine God with Super Saiyan 4. Think about it. They combine Super Saiyan with Super Saiyan God and Super Saiyan with Wrathful. So, could they do all three at once maybe? Beers is pretty surprised. These two just got Super Saiyan God and even more recently just got Super Saiyan Blue. They're already trying to move beyond it. Twice in a row. But that's better for him anyways. 
he didn't want a strong rival, and he got the Super Saiyan gods that he wanted to see. And you know what, if those two are willing to get stronger in any way possible, it's only natural that they're going to try to move on from those forms as quickly as they can. Although, it is a little weird for Whis. He's interested to learn about Super Saiyan 4. It's so primal compared to what they have with Super Saiyan God. Or even regular Super Saiyan for that matter. But he's definitely going to help them along the way in their path to getting stronger. As time passes, we're next going to go into Resurrection F. Of course, this is going to play out like normal in the beginning. Frieza's forces go to Earth, getting the Dragon Balls, reviving Frieza. Of course our group of heroes finds out when it's too late, but they don't mind. If someone's using the Dragon Balls for bad purposes, they'll be sure to stop the threat once it shows up. It will be a pretty good test of their power after all, but they do want to stop it sooner rather than later. Not much changes in the next few months. Frieza continues his training until he gets golden, then heading to Earth, ready to enact his revenge. To his surprise, the people there aren't Goku and Vegeta. He sees the other people that he saw on Namek, as well as some random Earthlings scattered about, but no Goku and Vegeta. But he can obviously tell that there's some Saiyans here still. Besides recognizing Gohan, he sees the other two, Goten and Trunks. Trunks has a tail, so we could obviously see that he's a Saiyan. And as for Goten, I mean, look at his hair. He's definitely Goku's kid. Whatever, Frieza will improvise. He'll beat these fighters and torture them until Goku and Vegeta show up. He wants them to watch the show. But that might not even be necessary. As you'd probably expect, Frieza's forces get defeated pretty easily. They weren't really a threat originally, and they're not going to be a threat here. He doesn't care about that, though. Frieza himself will step in, sorting this out. He wonders who would be stupid enough to challenge him. After all his training, he's so much stronger than before, and he wants them all to see how strong he's got. Surprisingly, the first one to step up is someone he doesn't really recognize. It's Cargo. He knows this is a Namekian, but he doesn't know who it is. But Cargo introduces himself. He's a Namekian that went to Earth to train with Piccolo. And he was there during all of Frieza's chaos on Namek. He remembers all the destruction and all the casualties caused by Frieza and his army. And he's actually kind of glad that he's got a chance to repay Frieza for it. Frieza laughs. There's no way a Namekian could be strong enough to challenge him. He's in his first form right now, and while he's laughing, Cargo delivers a punch. And Frieza could definitely feel it. His laughter stops and his cocky expression is wiped away. Just as he recollects himself, Cargo begins punching him more and more. Frieza taps a foot on the ground and launches himself up in the air, quickly transforming into his final form. He tells that Namekian he shouldn't have played dirty. Now he's pissed him off. Cargo wasn't even playing dirty. He was just being smart. He wanted to stop this right away, and even though Frieza's powered up now, he's confident he could stop this. The two of them begin their clash. And even in Frieza's final form, Cargo is too strong for him. He deals some pretty good damage to Frieza, and he's about to end the fight, but Frieza's able to buy time for himself. He launches a blast towards the Earthling fighters. Obviously Piccolo and Gohan are able to defend against it, but it's a distraction that causes Cargo to look away as Frieza then hits him. This increases the gap between them and allows Frieza some time to power up some more, showing off his newest form, Golden Frieza. Cargo can definitely see that Frieza's a lot stronger, and it turns out that Frieza actually has the upper hand. The two of them briefly exchange the blows, and Cargo does perform decently well, but he can tell it's not really going anywhere. The two of them stop as Gohan then yells out towards Frieza. Frieza laughs at this. How cute. One of the monkeys is getting a bit rowdy. What is it? He thinks he could stop this fight? Gohan confirms this. Frieza's surprised to see him acting so cocky. There's no way that he'd be able to defeat Golden Frieza. But Gohan tells Frieza one thing. He knows Frieza's scared of Super Saiyans. And Gohan does have access to Super Saiyan. But he lets Frieza in on a little secret. There's stages beyond Super Saiyan. Frieza's taken aback, but doesn't really believe it, and Gohan decides to show him, transforming into Super Saiyan 4. Frieza can't contain his laughter, he's literally transformed into a monkey, but his laughter stops as he's then hit in the back by Gohan. Frieza didn't even see Gohan move, it's like he teleported behind Frieza. Gohan actually has been working on Super Saiyan 4, and is trying to go beyond it somehow if he can. He doesn't need to rely on God Ki like Goku or Vegeta, because he feels like he could do something else with it, although he hasn't really tapped into that yet. One of the things he has done though is make Super Saiyan 4 much more efficient than it was in the Buu Saga, so stamina and time limits won't be a problem for him anymore. Although, he's not aiming to kill Frieza right now, he's aiming to distract Frieza, and it works perfectly. Frieza's so preoccupied with Gohan that he doesn't even notice Cargo behind him charging up an attack. As Gohan stares Frieza down, Gohan then stops levitating midair, dropping to the ground quickly. Frieza wonders why, as a beam then pierces through his chest. Piccolo actually gets a kick out of this. Cargo used his move, the Makanko Sapo. And it's actually hilarious to see Frieza humiliated in that way. Frieza falls down to the ground, dropping right in front of Piccolo. Somehow he's still alive. This guy's really a cockroach. Frieza weakly tries to prop himself up, and in front of him he sees the two Namekians. Consider this vengeance for what he did to planet Namek. Together, they both launch a Masenko, erasing the weakened Frieza from Earth, finishing the battle. If things got out of hand, Gohan would have gotten involved and stopped it, but he wanted to see how Cargo's grown. 
this was a great test of its abilities. He seemed to be powerful enough to match up against Frieza briefly. But even better, he saw the opportunity to kill Frieza and didn't hesitate. He's definitely grown a lot, and Piccolo's proud as well, obviously. Thankfully, Goku and Vegeta weren't needed. And it's kinda good for Goku and Vegeta because they have a surprise that they want to save, preparing to show it off in the next arc, the Universe X Tournament. So in terms of the team, I don't think it would be too different. Of course, we still have Goku, Vegeta, and Piccolo. In my opinion, there's not a need for Minaka here. They're already motivated enough, and they don't need Minaka there to motivate them even more. Goku and Vegeta are fine as is trying to pursue their newest forms. So, he gets to stay safe and doesn't get to be terrified. And the next two picks for the team are pretty obvious. They go for Gohan, and they recruit Cargo. Yeah, I know Gohan originally couldn't go because of scheduling issues, but in my opinion, that's pretty stupid and this is what if, and that's a really minor change, so he's going to be part of the tournament this time. That's like the smallest change I've had to make here. Not too big of an issue and allows Gohan to be part of this tournament, finally. And of course, Universe 6's team is the same. And let's keep the order the same as well. Goku goes up first against Batamo, and that's pretty standard. His fight with Frost would go the same too. Even though Goku's much stronger, Frost is still playing dirty and using poison. Piccolo then goes up against Frost. And while the tournament has gone pretty normal so far, things will change here. Piccolo actually stays in against Frost. Instead of Vegeta wanting to get in right away, he's confident that he'll eventually get his time to fight. And he is kind of interested in seeing how Piccolo performs. So, when they see that Frost is poisoning people, Piccolo stays in and goes up against Magetta. This is going to be a weird matchup. It's a lot more strategy based for Piccolo as he's trying to figure out ways to hurt Magetta, which isn't possible it seems. He seems to be a tricky fighter. His attacks are easy to avoid, but he's trying to wear Piccolo out with heat. Although, they eventually hear the weakness of the metal net. And it would be pretty easy for Piccolo to come up with an insult. So he wins against Magetta, although it wasn't really a satisfying fight for him. The next one is pretty interesting though. Piccolo vs. Kaba. It's weird seeing a Saiyan from another universe. But it's important to talk about Kaba because there's one thing that I do want to bring up. So obviously in the scenario we've been talking about Saiyans keeping their tails, but Universe 6 is different and apparently those Saiyans don't have tails. The good thing is in this arc, nothing's going to change with the Universe 6 Saiyans, since Piccolo is the one fighting Kaba. But I do want to ask one question. When we inevitably get into the Tournament of Power, would you prefer if the Saiyans stayed tailless in Universe 6, or do you want them to have tails as well? Like I said, it doesn't really matter here since Piccolo's not going to be teaching Kaba any Super Saiyan techniques or whatever. But it definitely will affect Universe 6 later on once we continue the story more. So let me know below if you want me to keep them the same, or if you want them to have tails just like the ones in Universe 7. This scenario is more focused on Universe 7 Saiyans after all, but since we are talking about Saiyans in general, it's worth asking you guys about it. And if you're watching this in the future, well, obviously you see the answer soon enough with the next few parts. Anyways, this fight is a pretty friendly one. Piccolo is surprised at Kappa's strength, and he's even more surprised to hear that he doesn't know about Super Saiyan or anything. Obviously, Piccolo is not the one that's going to be able to teach him that. But Kappa did see it used before with Goku, and he is wondering if he's capable of doing it. Piccolo ends up winning the fight here, and next he's up against Hit. And you guys know Piccolo is my favorite character, but gotta be honest here, he's not going to do anything against Hit. Sorry to say, he loses here. And next up is Gohan, showing off Super Saiyan 4. Kappa's amazed to see this. There's more beyond just Super Saiyan? And this is fun for Gohan because it's been a while since he got to use his full power. Hit's actually caught off guard by this. Gohan doesn't waste time screwing around here. He knows Hit has some weird time abilities, so he tries working around that the best he can. He does actually get a few hits in, no pun intended, and Hit could definitely feel the power behind them. Gohan is starting to see through Hit's tricks, but as Hit fights, he continues improving. He starts getting more serious, and he completely overwhelms Gohan. Not to mention with his time abilities improving, Gohan can't even land an attack anymore. He tries his best to stay in the arena, but eventually loses to Hit. The next one to go up is Vegeta, and Hit immediately notices he's way more confident than anyone else. He questions Vegeta. Even after seeing Hit's abilities and his power, why is Vegeta still so confident? Is it just some false hope, or does he actually have some good tricks up his sleeve? Vegeta just tells Hit to watch closely. Vegeta's pacing himself, using all of his Super Saiyan forms, eventually jumping up to Super Saiyan Blue. Kaba's mind keeps getting blown over and over again. Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan 4, Super Saiyan Blue. How many of these things are there? Hit's not really too phased by this. Even in Super Saiyan Blue, there's a gap in power between Vegeta and Hit. But this is mainly just to gauge Hit's power, as well as trying to see through Hit's technique. Vegeta's a very strategic fighter, as we know. And by now, not only has he gauged Hit's power, but he feels like he knows a way to work around Hit's time skip. He's just going to need more strength and more speed. And he has the perfect idea for that. He has one more form beyond Blue. Wow, Gohan and Piccolo really miss a lot. They didn't even know about Blue until now. But apparently there's something beyond that? Goku is a bit bummed though. He knows once Vegeta uses this power, the fight will be over and Goku won't get a chance to fight Hit. But whatever, he'll let Vegeta have his fun. 
Vegeta then begins powering up in front of Hit. The tiles in the arena begin levitating, and at first the key doesn't bother Hit, but as Vegeta continues powering up more and more, he's getting a little bit more concerned. Vegeta's hair grows longer, fur appears on his body, and the transformation completes. He goes into... Super Saiyan 4. Hit's confused, this is the same thing that Gohan used. But Vegeta smirks, then letting out a shout. A brilliant purplish light fills the arena, as Vegeta's power-up completes. As the light dissipates, everyone looks in the arena and sees. Vegeta's the only one standing there. In that split-split second, he knocked Hit out of the ring. And Hit's just standing there amazed. He tried to react, but he wasn't fast enough to. But in that split second, he saw something. Vegeta very briefly transformed into a new state. But because of how quick it was, he couldn't even get a glimpse of it. This is also a problem that Goku and Vegeta have. They do have this power within them, but at the moment, it's in such an imperfect state that they can't use it for long. They're trying to turn it into an actual form, and they know how to transform into it, but the power of it is just so insane that it drains Ki way too fast, and it's hard to maintain control of. Even they don't really know what this form looks like, but in that brief moment, Hit saw a glimpse of it. It was like Super Saiyan 4, but there was a purplish tint to it somehow but Vegeta was moving so fast that it was basically a blur. Hit can't even recount what it looked like. Vegeta tells Hit all about this form and what they're trying to do with it. It's definitely not completed yet and they got a long way to go, but he tells Hit that he'd like to fight again sometime, testing out his power even further. Universe 7 has won the tournament, but that leaves a question. What is this power that Vegeta just used? As you could probably guess, it's a mix of Wrathful, Super Saiyan, and Super Saiyan God. So in this scenario for the new form, I've decided to go with something different. There's no point in me doing Super Saiyan God 4 or Super Saiyan Blue 4 because that wouldn't really make sense. If that were a thing, by default it should be Super Saiyan Blue 4 since there's already Super Saiyan in Super Saiyan 4. I, I know this is kind of confusing but I'm just trying to explain myself here. Really this would be its own separate thing, you'd have the three forms combined together already. Actually you know what, I'll throw a little chart on screen showing what I mean. Super Saiyan plus Super Saiyan God equals Blue, Super Saiyan plus Wrathful equals Super Saiyan 4, at least in this series. But if you can combine all of them together, it's going to make this brand new form. Vegeta and Goku still don't know much about it, but they refer to it by one name. They just refer to it as Wrathful God. Wrathful Super Saiyan infused with the power of a Super Saiyan God. But what is this mysterious new power, and will Goku and Vegeta actually access it? So just like I mentioned, they're still trying to work on actually fixing this form. Right now, it's not actually really like a form. I mean, it is a transformation, but with how little they can control it, it essentially acts as a technique. They transform for a split second to attack and that does give them a huge boost in power. But again, it's only for a split second, and they can't actually use the form for as long as they want. And they still don't even really know what it looks like. Beerus and Whis actually did catch a glimpse of it while they were training. It was almost like a purplish version of Super Saiyan 4 in a way. Although, they do get really excited about the power of the form. From what little they've used it, they can see that it drastically increases all of their properties. Their speed, their strength, their durability, everything. Whenever they use it, they basically turn into flashes of light because they're moving so fast. When they attack, it leaves behind purple flames from their aura, as they transform back into a regular Super Saiyan 4. Although, there is one downside to this form. It's not a flaw or anything, or anything that they actually even knew about. It's the fact that someone else could use this power for evil. Because now, Zamasu is plotting on striking, or at least this timeline Zamasu. The other Zamasus, yeah, they've already been hard at work. And this is exactly what they had in mind. I could honestly do Goku Black or Vegeta Black, but for simplicity, let's do Goku Black. It's not like Vegeta Black's incredibly unique anyways, and in this scenario it would kind of just be a reskin. So we're going with Goku Black, and when he stole Goku's body, he was hoping he'd be able to harness this power for himself. Maybe he can make it more divine in a way. When he saw that Super Saiyan 4 form, it just looked too ugly and primal. It was disgusting, but he can't say it wasn't powerful. Or at least whatever technique Vegeta used, or a form if that's what that was, well that thing was really powerful. Goku Black wants that for himself. Oh, and yeah, a little side note, we get to see Goku Black with a tail in the scenario too. It is Goku's body after all. He thinks it's kind of gross to have one, it makes him really feel like a monkey. But all that matters is the Zero Mortals plan, not the tails. And even though future Gohan is there with future Trunks, having an extra person won't be enough against this Goku Black. They do try and defend their timeline, but eventually it comes to a point where they have to go back to the past. Samurai Jack. Hopefully they're going to find some help back there, in order to stop Goku Black, so they can return back to the future, Marty McFly. That was kind of corny. Anyways, they go back to the past, and they give everyone the whole story. Wait, so there's Goku in the future, killing people? That doesn't sound right. How was, how was that even possible? Well, they get their answer when he comes through a portal. Out of anger, future Gohan goes to fight him. Even though he knows he might not win, he's just pissed with this guy following him around. Although, the fact that he's angry might actually help him. Goku follows him into battle too. 
and Goku Black is amused at first, but the smirk is wiped off his face as the two begin attacking him. Gohan means business, and since Goku's not going to sit there for exposition, he gets right down to work as well. The two play a game of Saiyan volleyball with him, attacking him back and forth, and eventually Goku Black has no other choice but to try and escape. But each of them considers this as a win. Goku was able to gauge his power, which didn't seem like too much of a threat, and Goku Black was able to gauge their power, as well as getting more power for himself. He returns to the future, meeting up with Zamasu. Zamasu heals him, and Goku Black thinks he's finally found the secret to transform him. Not only has he gotten the power that he needs, but he's gotten motivation now, and more anger. First, he shows this off to Zamasu, and his hair turns pink for some reason. Well, the form does look nice, but this isn't what he was expecting. He thought he'd get that weird monkey form that they have. This form is strong though, so it will be useful, but he wants to get that form, or he assumes he's gonna get his own version. This form that he has right now, which he names Rosé, it seems to be one of an actual god. Not someone mocking god, but a god using the actual godly powers. And look at him, he's already improved their Super Saiyan form, making it look much more divine and proper. So he's sure he could take that weird gross monkey form and do the same. But he's trying to think, how do they actually access that power? They're gonna have to do some research. Zamas was able to figure out that Saiyans are actually able to transform into great apes. Whenever in the presence of a full moon, they lose all control and fully transform. Well, maybe they have to try this, so Zamasu and Goku Black venture out. And you know what? A perfect place to do this would be a city. It would give them a nice place to destroy. And in the middle of the night, a moon comes out, but it's not a full moon. Well, looks like Zamasu's gonna have to screw with the moon cycle a bit. What would be the easiest way to do this? Should he move the earth and the moon? Or should he just find a way for Goku Black to get more light from the moon? Yeah, that last option seems easier. As a Kai, he might be able to create something to force this form to come out. Maybe he could replicate whatever's radiating off the moon to actually force this to happen. He could create blood waves. He doesn't know exactly what's coming off the moon to make him transform, but from his research, it was something called blood waves, so maybe he's gotta just recreate that. And this shouldn't be hard for a literal god that can create anything. So he does so, bombarding Goku Black with all of them. And just as they expected, he begins transforming. Goku Black laughs, as his voice gets deeper and deeper, and he grows larger and larger. He turns into a great ape, and he surprisingly does have some control. It must be due to the fact that he's in Kakarot's body, someone who already did have control over this. But the form itself isn't that powerful. So Zamasu begins thinking as they keep training. Well, he knows they control this power and use it in a humanoid form, but maybe he uses some other power on top of that. What if they combine it with Super Saiyan or something? Or at least Goku Black's version of that, Super Saiyan Rose. As Goku Black tries destroying a city in this form, he says that that might actually work. So while he's a great ape, he tries transforming, going Super Saiyan Rose. By this point, a few days have passed. And this is just around the time everyone else is heading back to the future. Just as they arrive, they know something bad is happening when they see a giant pink monkey in the distance. That's definitely not a good sign, and it's a little weird too. Why, why is he pink? Well, they have seen weirder stuff, but yeah, this is still kind of weird. They know exactly what he's trying to accomplish though. They don't know why he's pink, but he's definitely trying to act as Wrathful Super Saiyan just like they have. So quickly they fly over to the area, hoping they can get there in time to cut his tail off. But as they get closer and closer, he begins shrinking. Oh no. That means he's done it, hasn't he? And it's too late. Once they get there, they don't see a giant monkey anymore. They see a Kai, Zamasu. Oh, that was that person they were investigating in the past, just like they thought. But where did Goku Black go? They're hoping he didn't actually do what they think he did. They then sense a very ominous presence behind them, as a massive Kiai knocks them all back. As they get back up, they look and see. Someone is floating above them, casting a shadow in front of the moon. He descends downwards into plain sight. It is Goku Black, but in a much different form. It's his own version of Super Saiyan 4. He can combine Super Saiyan Rose with the power of a great ape, creating whatever this is. Although he does have a complaint, the form still does look a little bit too primitive. But no matter, he's only using this power to expunge the earth of morals. And in his own way, he did make this form look much more divine and proper. Goku and Vegeta instantly turn Super Saiyan 4, trying to use that other form that they were using before. At first, they're able to land a few attacks on Goku Black, this catches him off guard, but then he realizes what they were doing. It's the thing Vegeta used during the Universe 6 tournament, and now we can finally see what's happening. They're using a form that they don't have control of. They can only use it so briefly that it only appears in little flashes. He thinks it's kind of funny and pathetic. Is that really all they can manage? And you know what? They realize what Goku Black is saying is actually right. They want to do more with this. They want to learn to control it. And they've been training so hard for it too. Maybe this will serve as the motivation for them. Maybe, during this fight, they can master it somehow or at least get a grasp on it in order to use it as long as they want. They need to focus. This is a life or death situation after all. Amidst their fight with Goku Black, they begin trying to focus that power. And once again, they erupt in purple flames. 
Goku Black takes note of this too. They use it once again, but this time they actually use it for a bit longer. Instead of it being a split second, they were actually in it for a noticeable amount of time, just a few seconds. Wait a second, they might be learning the trick to actually maintain the form. They try it again, trying to maintain all of their energy, making sure this time that it doesn't all erupt out from them. And once again, Goku Black catches a glimpse of the form, but they lose it once more. All right, third time's a charm, maybe this will work. They attack Goku Black once more, using the form right when they punch him. And as their punch connects, the purple flames from around them disappear. And this time, everyone gets a good look at it. They're actually in the form, and they're just a surprise. Mockingly, Goku Black commends them, although this won't be enough to defeat him. Surely they won't be able to use this form reliably in battle. Goku Black's just naturally advantage for being a god. And look at these two, trying to mock him once more. It's pitiful. Zamasu watches on as much as he can as well, although Gohan and Trunks are taking care of him so he can't really focus too much. And this fight actually seems pretty even. They're both able to take on Goku Black together, although something weird's happening. Goku Black notices his power, it's being drained somehow. The more he fights, the more of that energy he loses. Goku and Vegeta notice this too. It seems the gap in between them is getting closer and closer, and Goku Black is fighting more slowly. Suddenly an aura encapsulates him, and as the aura disappears, he's back in his base form. Wait, what happened to his form? Goku and Vegeta completely forgot. If you remember back to a few parts ago, when they first got Super Saiyan 4 or Wrathful Super Saiyan, everyone was having a really tough time maintaining it, at least for a prolonged period of time. The form was quite draining for them, and for an unexperienced fighter, it's not something that they could pull off for long. And that's something Goku Black never realized. This is his first time using the form, and he did use it for a surprisingly long amount of time, but still. Even someone like him couldn't maintain it enough. And another thing is, he doesn't know how to actually access the form without the move. And Goku and Vegeta take note of this. Together, they both tackle Goku Black, instantly propelling him to the other side of the planet. Gohan and Trunks follow, as Zamasu teleports over there. Goku Black doesn't realize why they did this, but then he looks up at the sky. It's daytime, or, well, it looks like daytime, they can't see from all the smoke, but there's no moon there. He's not going to be able to turn into this form again unless he has the moon. He's still relying on that because he doesn't know how to do it otherwise. He powers up, trying to access it once more, but this time, all he does is go into normal Rosé. It just looks like regular Super Saiyan with pink hair. And yeah, it seems strong, but not as strong as what they're in right now. Although the same goes for Goku and Vegeta. They have a tough time maintaining their new form and it dissipates alongside Goku Black's. So, the fight's actually more even now. Goku Black's using Rosé, while Goku and Vegeta power up into Super Saiyan God. A battle between the three godly forms commences. And the good thing is Goku and Vegeta haven't lost too much energy, but Goku Black is really drained. They just need to keep him away from Zamasu so Zamasu doesn't heal him. Goku Black continues his fight confidently, but suddenly his body turns around. Some force is pulling him away, and then he realizes what's happening and begins cursing. He keeps trying to fight Goku and Vegeta, but his body is pulled away more and more. Zamasu activated the fusion, thinking that there is no other choice. Goku Black says it's too soon to do that, but it's already too late. The earring is on Zamasu's other ear, and they're already fusing. Zamasu tells Goku Black this is the only way. He couldn't maintain that primate form. Because of his failure, they're gonna need to fuse. The resulting fusion is a pretty angry one, since the two were bickering in the middle of their fusion. Zamasu was mad at Goku Black, and Goku Black was mad at Zamasu. And now, fuse Zamasu is gonna take out the anger on everyone. Alright, this might be a little bit of an issue. Goku and Vegeta power up into Wrathful God again, with Trunks and Gohan trying to help as well. Although, Merge Zamasu seems to be too much for them to handle. But wait, if these two fused, maybe they should do that too. Bring Gogeta back. Gogeta was really strong, and if he uses this new form, it might really help out in battle. But as Goku and Vegeta are fighting Zamasu, they notice two other energies come nearby. It's Shin and Goasu. They've traveled to this timeline as well, trying to offer help somehow, as well as figuring what's going on and why it's taking so long. Gowasu doesn't understand why Shin brought him here, but then he sees, Zamasu. No wonder why Beerus and Whis investigated them before. What's Zamasu doing in this timeline? And actually a better question, what is Zamasu doing in his timeline now that he's gone? He only went with Shin because Shin needed his time rings. But now, it seems like he's here for a different purpose. He needs to help stop his student. Or at least, whatever this version of his student is. He looks different, but then Gowasu realizes, he's fused with someone. Zamasu's glad to see his master here. He could witness the destruction of all mortals. Gohan flies over to the two Kai's, trying to explain what's happening. But then he realizes, the two of them, they have those same earrings that Zamasu had. Wait, Goku and Vegeta were mentioning something about fusion, but the fusion dance. Although, now is their shot to use that kind of fusion that Zamasu used. Gohan asks if those earrings will make people fuse, and Goasu confirms. What is he planning, having those other two Saiyans fusing? Exactly. Well, without any other better ideas, he gives Gohan the two earrings. He flies up during the middle of the fight, surprising Goku and Vegeta. This actually distracts Zamasu enough for him to give the two earrings to them. And he tells them what to do. Vegeta, put it on his right ear. Goku, put it on his left ear. 
Don't waste any time. This will work just like fusion, and they won't need to do the dance for it. They thank Gohan, and thank Goasu and Shin as well. Talk about good timing. The two place the earrings on, and it creates a brand new fusion. One that isn't Gogeta, but is similar. In this new body, the fusion is pretty surprised at how strong he is, even in base. But he needs a name. How about Vegito? Yeah, that's a good name. This only serves to anger Zamasu more and more. Great, they're mocking him once more, using another godly power. Angered, Zamasu launches a blast at Goasu, but Vegito vanishes and appears right in front of the blast. Even if Zamasu is immortal, Vegito has an idea on how to finish this. It seems his body isn't completely immortal, and he might be able to destroy it somehow. And for that, he needs power. A lot of power. He begins powering up. Fur grows on his body, and his hair grows longer as his eyes change color too. Just like Gogeta, Vegito is now using Super Saiyan 4, although he's not done here. He gauges his power against Zamasu, and just in Super Saiyan 4 alone, he's actually outpacing Zamasu. But that's not going to be enough. He needs to completely try and destroy him somehow. Zamasu's surprised to see how strong they got this quickly, but Vegito tells him he has one more trick up his sleeve. He's coated in purple flames, as his fur and hair take on a purplish tint. In this body, he might be able to maintain this form better, although it still will be fleeting. After a burst of energy, Vegito is revealed to be in Wrathful God. Zamasu tries to attack him, but nothing's working. Vegito is so quick, and even when he does get a hit in, Vegito just disregards it. He doesn't even care. Now it's his turn. He completely overwhelms Zamasu with his attacks. More and more parts of Zamasu's body keep getting destroyed, and they keep regenerating. Although, Vegito notices something. One part of Zamasu's body isn't regenerating correctly. It's turning purple. That's how he knows it's working, and he thinks he has a way to finish this. He's going to take notes from what he did as Gogeta. If you remember from a few parts ago, Gogeta negated Boo's evil energy, infusing attacks with his own positive energy. He's going to try that again here, and it might work against Zamasu, as well as buffing his own attacks. He puts his hands in front of him, then drawing them back. Electricity swirls around him, as he forms a final Kamehameha, but a special one. Instead of it being yellow and blue, it's actually rainbowish in color. The energy within this will destroy Zamasu, he's sure of it. He launches the massive blast, and Zamasu is hopeless to defend against it. Not only is the blast powerful enough to damage him, but his body completely begins deteriorating, turning into dust due to the massive positive energy within it. And while Vegito's firing this attack, he suddenly defuses. Oh, he didn't realize the fusion would only last a few minutes. Gowasu theorizes they were using too much power, which was actually the case here. But it doesn't matter, because that power was way more than what they needed. Zamasu's completely gone, and that attack was special enough to erase him. If only Zamasu remained fully immortal, he might have lived through this. Well, it looks like everyone can head back home. Trunks and Gohan are thankful for everyone's help, but there is one thing that stays on their minds. Wow, they're kind of far behind from everyone. They've still been trying to access that Super Saiyan 4 form since the Cell games, at least when they saw it with Goku and Vegeta. And you know what? Maybe after all this, they could finally reach that goal. They're going to keep working towards that, and they'll rebuild this future as well. Everyone says their goodbyes, and this is where we'll leave off for now. He, Gohan, and Trunks are training together, working towards Super Saiyan 4 for the Saiyans. After what they saw last time, they really want to get stronger. They've known about this form for a while but never were able to access it. But with their little training that they got from Goku and Vegeta last time, now they're more confident than ever and have more knowledge than ever. But it makes Cargo think. It would be nice if he had a form like that too, or just any transformation at all. He wonders if his past self has found out anything like that, which is something you should keep in mind. While they enjoy their relative peace in the future, it seems the past is something new to deal with. It's been about a year since then, and in terms of power, everyone has grown stronger, but they have a new challenge to face, the Tournament of Power. And this actually might be very good for them, well, at least for Goku and Vegeta. Goku's very excited to test his new power, and while Vegeta does have the responsibility of having a new kid, Whis helps him out with that. So now he can join the tournament and show off his newfound strength. The two of them have a much better grasp on Wrathful God than they did before. During the Universe X tournament, they couldn't even use it for a split second. And against Goku Black, they barely were able to use it, but now, they actually have a more full control on it. Of course, it still is very draining compared to their other forms, but still, the fact that they can use it for much longer is way better than before. Obviously, it's not like they're going to be 100% efficient with it right now. That remains to be seen. But it's not like they're the only ones getting stronger. Gohan's been working towards a new power as well, so have Piccolo and Cargo. But those powers will remain to be seen. In terms of a team for the tournament of power, well, it's pretty simple. Obviously, Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Cargo, and Piccolo are there. And even though it might be a little bit risky to include them on the team, Goten and Trunks might help due to their power. Piccolo and Cargo will keep them on their check after all, so as long as they don't screw anything up, it should be okay. And that leaves three more members, which is perfect because that means Krillin, Tenshinhan, and Roshi will join the team. And just like that, we have 10 people, meaning we're now ready to head to the tournament itself. And before the tournament begins, I want to give a little side note. A lot of you actually preferred if the universe Saiyans stayed tailless, essentially like they were normally. 
And even though the scenario is about Saiyans keeping their tails, it kinda does make sense because the Universe 6 Saiyans evolved to not have them, while the Universe 7 Saiyans in this scenario are just growing them back. So yeah, it's a pretty simple explanation, and it makes things easier for me to be honest. Not like it would matter much anyways, because as you could probably tell, Universe 7 is way ahead of everyone else regardless. Tails or not, it's not like Universe 6 would pull ahead. And right off the bat, it's pretty apparent how far ahead of Universe 7 is. Even with the weaker fighters like Krillin, Tenshin and Roshi, they're not even having that much trouble, mainly because their allies are so strong. For example, Krillin does eventually get knocked off first, but in the nick of time he's saved by Cargo, who stretches out one of his arms, grabbing him off stage. Wow, Piccolo should be doing this too. It's almost like this is something he should have done in the original story, you know, using his Namekian abilities to his advantage during the tournament. But at least he remembers here. This means Krillin and Tenshinhan are saved from their eliminations. Something similar happens with Roshi. Originally, he forfeited because he lost too much stamina. But something changes here. Goku rushes over to help Roshi after he collapses, but Cargo does too. He says he has something he wants to test out first. His future self has the ability to heal people, due to him having fused with Dende. And while he's not fused with Dende here, he wonders if he can access that without actually fusing. And he's had this thought for a while. Of course, he can't do it as well as Dende, since that's an innate skill with him versus Cargo trying to learn it on his own. However, the fact that he has it is pretty helpful. Not to mention, in exchange for getting this technique, Dende wanted to learn a bit how to fight. So it's a win-win for both of them. Now he couldn't fully heal Roshi, but he did save Roshi from death. And Roshi still does forfeit from the tournament. But this surprises Goku and the others. Cargo being able to heal people will be very helpful. And he was a bit unsure if Zeno would be okay with this, but there's no items involved, so it's all good. They have a healer on their team and they didn't even realize. And even if it's not a full heal, so what? The fact that they have someone like that is very helpful. Especially considering what the next fight's about to be, Goku versus Jiren. Goku begins cycling through his forms, and nothing seems to work. Even when he gets up to Wrathful God, that seems to do the most, but even then, it doesn't really phase Jiren that much. So he breaks out a spirit bomb, asking the team for energy, and they gladly lend it to him except for Vegeta. And Jiren has a harder time pushing it back now. It's a spirit bomb from a stronger team, being pushed by a stronger person, since Goku's using Wrathful God to push it back. But even so, it's not like this is going to be enough to overpower Jiren. Sure, it briefly does push him back a bit, but Jiren eventually shows off more and more power, being able to easily push the spirit bomb back. And pretty much like normal, Goku falls in, unlocking Ultra Instinct Omen. But something's different this time. Well, not entirely. The fact that he has a tail is actually really helpful with Ultra Instinct. Think about it, it's an extra limb to help him parry and counter with. Besides the fact that having the tail does make him stronger in general. Using UI Omen does get him a bit further than he originally did. However, he eventually does drop out of it, somewhat injured and completely out of stamina too, but thankfully Cargo is there to help heal him. And this isn't like when Frieza lended energy to Goku, he's actually getting healed here. Now, Cargo can't restore his full power, although it does heal Goku's injuries, and it does give him a little bit of rejuvenation. He will still need to rest a bit, but this is huge. His energy is replenished a bit, and he got stronger due to being healed. The longer the tournament goes on, the more helpful this will become. Goku ends up facing the Saiyans from Universe 6, and it's a lot easier for him since he's actually healed, and although he would love to train them and see more of their power, he is eventually led to knock them out of the ring. Universe 7 continues gaining more and more ground, and eventually, some of the remaining Universe 11 fighters face off against Universe 7, specifically Dispo and Topo teaming up against Gohan, Piccolo, and Cargo. They realize that Cargo should be a pretty big priority, I mean, he can't heal after all, and they gotta get rid of him before anyone else. But Universe 7 isn't gonna make it that easy for them. Piccolo and Cargo are working towards something new, but they're not able to show it off yet. It's still just in its beginning stages, but as for Gohan, he actually does have something up his sleeve that he's been hiding. He thought of it a while ago. If Wrathful is just Super Saiyan combined with Great Ape, can't he just combine Super Saiyan 2 with that as well? In principle, it seems pretty simple, but in practice, it's going to give him a huge boost in power. He goes into Wrathful Super Saiyan and begins powering up. Not much changes about the form itself. His hair gets a bit spikier, his eyes change color, and he gets electricity around him. But overall, it still looks pretty much similar to how regular Super Saiyan 4 looks. This is what he calls Wrathful Super Saiyan 2, or we could just call it Ascended Super Saiyan 4. Again, they don't actually know it's called Super Saiyan 4, but we do. This gives Gohan a huge advantage during the battle. Topo and Dispo immediately notice his speed increase, especially Dispo. Besides Gohan getting stronger in terms of offense and defense, the speed is what really helps him. First, he aims to take out Dispo, who seems to be the most annoying threat. And it's pretty simple. Dispo didn't expect someone to outspeed him that easily, and Gohan uses Dispo's confusion as an opportunity, being able to knock him out of the ring. That leaves just Topo versus the three of them. And with these three together, he's not that big of a deal either. If he transformed, it would have been a different story, but they don't even give him the opportunity. The raw technique and power of Cargo and Piccolo combined is insane. Add that with the huge power of Gohan and his techniques here, and you've got a pretty deadly combo. 
Goten and Trunks are about to join the fight, but it's too late already. Topo's already knocked out of the ring. It's a good thing Goten and Trunks are still in though. They've been facing some of the weaker fighters, and they are having a lot of fun. But now they might be getting out of their league. Unless they fuse. It has been a bit of time since they fuse, and they realize that maybe if they go into Gotenks, they could probably try and pull off Super Saiyan 4 somehow. Gohan tells them they're not quite there yet, but if they keep working towards it, he could help them. But they'll have to worry about that after the tournament. Right now, their main threat seems to be Jiren, and Goku and Vegeta go up to face him once more. Thanks to having been healed by Cargo, Goku did see a nice increase in power, and Vegeta, well, he's Vegeta. He's obviously going to be strong regardless, and the two of them together is a nice combo. And it seems they are making some progress when fighting Jiren, but even so, they need more power. Goku's increase in strength wasn't enough. He needs to get Ultra Instinct again. That's what will really help him here. As they are right now, it'll be tough. Goku begins fighting more intensely, hoping he can push himself to Ultra Instinct somehow once more. He needs that catalyst again. He needs to be pushed to his limit. It would be great if this was something he could activate at will, but it's not yet. Whatever power that was was even greater than Wrathful God. As Jiren shows off more and more power, Goku feels the power coursing within him. And eventually, it clicks. He calms his heart and mind. And he's able to dodge Jiren once more, then activating UI Omen again. The remaining fighters in other universes are defeated by the other fighters in Universe 7, and they recognize that Goku and Vegeta need their help. Although, Goku's new power is back, and Cargo takes note of this. He noticed how draining it was before, and he wants to try and help again. Even if he only can heal a little bit, he rushes over and tries to heal Goku again. Of course, Jiren's not going to let that happen a second time. He tries to take out Cargo, but Piccolo jumps in the way, defending his student and nearly getting knocked out in the process, but he does catch himself by extending an arm, something he should have done originally. Vegeta also helps distract Jiren, and Cargo is able to restore Goku a little bit. His healing is slow, and again, he can't do it fully. So in that brief moment, he wasn't able to fully restore Goku, but it's just enough to give him a power boost, and more stamina. Goku gets a second wind, joining Vegeta again. Jiren throws a punch at Goku, but he dodges, grabbing Jiren's arm with his tail, flipping Jiren over his head. Vegeta dashes behind Goku to hit Jiren with an attack, and the two work together for the first time in a while. The two Namekians and the other Saiyans from Universe 7 join in as well and Jiren knows who his most important target is. It's Cargo. He can't let a healer stay on the team, so he puts all his focus on him first. Cargo's not necessarily too strong. He's powerful, but he's nothing in comparison to Jiren, so it's a pretty easy defeat. And with that, Universe 7 lost one of their most valuable fighters. They are pressuring Jiren more and more, but also, Ui's also running out with a lack of stamina from Goku. But a flash of light then appears in the ring, as Jiren's then attacked by a bunch of ghosts that look like Gotenks. Wait, the kids fused? Piccolo told them he didn't want them to fuse. But they did it for a different reason. By fusing into Gotenks, they gained a ton of energy, and he's surprised to see they give all of their energy to Goku. It was a pretty smart and mature choice from them. Gohan joins in too, powering up to his max and lending all of his energy to Goku. Piccolo then joins in too. This not only helps restore Goku, but the energy that his allies lend him, it gives him even more power. Then one last supply of ki flies towards him. It's from Krillin. He's still barely in the ring, but this last bit of ki is what pushes Goku over the edge, causing him to reawaken into something else. Everyone put their hope and trust into him. Even Vegeta's helping him out by distracting Jiren at the moment. This power not only restores him, but motivates him. His eyes flash and his aura flares up, and Goku disappears. Suddenly, Jiren's hit by a powerful kick to the face, and everyone looks on in awe. Goku has white hair. Ultra Instinct has improved once more. Jiren shows off his full power, but even with that, it's not enough. Goku is so much stronger in the scenario, especially with UI, and he has a lot more energy than he originally did. Plus, he has people helping alongside him, specifically Vegeta. The other fighters are there too, although most of their energy did go to Goku. It's a stronger Goku, with more energy, an Ultra Instinct, with an extra limb too. Even at his full power, Jiren can't hope to defeat him. As the two clash, the entire arena is destroyed more and more. But of course only one person can come out on top. And that person is Goku. With one massive Kamehameha, Jiren is blasted through the ring and into the void. With most of the ring being destroyed by this attack too. Goku lands back on the ground, still maintaining UI. And Universe 7 has claimed victory. As for an MVP, it would have been great to give it to Cargo, but since he was eliminated, he won't be getting it. But he did provide a huge help, and without him, they wouldn't have won. So of course, the next best pick is Goku. And even though Goku didn't know what to wish for originally, I feel like he would have enough sense to wish all the universes back. Either so he could fight everyone again, or because it just seems like the right wish to make. He powers down back into base, surprised at what just happened. He never knew that power was within him, and that's what Whis wanted them to access all along. Of course, Vegeta is impressed, but he hides it. He's unsure if that's something he'll be able to obtain, but even if he can't, he has something else in mind. Piccolo congratulates all of his students, Gohan, Goten, Trunks, and Cargo. They all performed amazingly, and even though he wasn't the only one that taught the Saiyans, his teachings definitely did help. And as for Cargo, Piccolo could tell he taught him well. It's kind of a shame though. 
They are still working towards something else, but it seems a little bit too early to show it off now. Even if they were able to access it, it still wouldn't have been too helpful in this tournament. They've been trying to use godly power for themselves. And they're almost at the point where they could do it, but they're not quite there yet. And as for Goten and Trunks, they still want to get Super Saiyan 4 for themselves, specifically for Gotenks because that seems the most likely. But this is good. It sets goals for everyone in the group. Goku needs to work towards UI more and more. Vegeta needs to work towards whatever he wants. Piccolo and Cargo have their own forms to obtain. Gohan's going to continue down the path of improving Wrathful Super Saiyan, trying to perfect whatever power he has now. And as for Goten and Trunks, they want what everyone else has. But of course, they're going to have to take it one step at a time. All the universes are restored, Zeno's happy, and Universe 7 is safe and victorious. Beerus breathes a sigh of relief. Following the tournament, Goku and Vegeta go back to training with Beerus and Whis. Obviously, it is a huge goal of theirs to improve Wrathful God to make it as efficient and as powerful as possible. It seems that they have no limits with this form. And they could probably do some really great things with it if they keep training with it. But as for Goku, he also wants to work towards something else. He used Ultra Instinct in the tournament, and he wants to get access to that again. This is the one thing that he's seen that is actually above Wrathful God in terms of power. Who knows, maybe he can access it again. Maybe he can combine the two. The possibilities seem crazy, and he's hyped up for it. While well, Vegeta's just there trying to catch up to Goku once more. But he may have found his own ways of doing so. Of course, these two aren't the only ones training. Back on Earth, Piccolo, Gokan, and Cargo are also training themselves. After unlocking Wrathful Super Saiyan 2, Gohan continues working on this to try and improve it as well, similar to what Goku and Vegeta are doing with their forms. And as for Piccolo and Cargo, it seems they almost have a grasp on their power, but they're not quite there yet. Thankfully, they're the perfect training partners for each other, plus Gohan's there too. Even if they're not doing crazy training with Beerus and Whis, they're still training and doing very well. One day on Earth, they get a pretty interesting visitor. Amidst their training, they sense some powers coming towards them. Thankfully, it's not anything malicious, and it turns out to be the Galactic Patrol. They're actually looking for Majin Buu. And they get some pretty bad news. Majin Buu is apparently dead. He was obliterated a while ago by Gogeta. And they're wondering why they would need Majin Buu in the first place. So, Mayrish begins explaining to them. First, he tells them all about Majin Buu's powers, as well as who is actually a part of him. But more importantly, they learn of the fact that Moro is out there somewhere. And that's the reason they needed Majin Buu. There's a powerful magician going around destroying planets. Or at least, that seems to be his plan. Piccolo, Cargo, and Gohan decide to offer help. Yeah, they might not be Majin Buu and have the magical abilities that they need, but they're still strong enough. They might be able to find a way to work around Moro's magic. Mayrish tells them it might be dangerous, but they don't care. This is the better option after all. What, are they just going to let him go around doing what he does? They should at least try and do this. So the three of them go with the Galactic Patrol, and they're surprised to learn that he's actually heading to Namek right now. Cargo's a bit concerned to hear about this. He's definitely going for the Dragon Balls. He doesn't want to watch his people get destroyed again. Nor does Piccolo. This only motivates them more to defeat Moro. They'll try whatever's possible. And they're not going to stop until they actually defeat him. After some time, their ship arrives there, but they're actually a bit too late. Moro's already there and he's got a head start. The destruction has already begun. Piccolo and Cargo immediately head out, not wasting any time. Before he follows them, Zohan asks Mayrus if there's anything they should know about in terms of his magic. They don't know too much about it, besides the fact that he can steal people's energy. They need to figure out a way to work around that. That's his deadliest technique. It sounds like it'll be tough, but Gohan's not going to give up. He follows Piccolo and Cargo as they chase down Moro. The two Namekians greet him, and Moro laughs. What, there's more Namekians trying to fight him? That didn't work so far. But something's different about these two. As they start fighting Moro together, it turns out that they're actually pretty strong. Way stronger than any other Namekian that he's faced so far. But more surprisingly, another fighter comes in. And it's not a Namekian, it's a Saiyan. Or at least what appears to be one. You can't tell what Gohan is when he's in his Wrathful Super Saiyan form. With Gohan even powering up further into Wrathful Super Saiyan 2. The three of them fight together, trying their hardest to defeat Moro. And at first, it seems like they're actually going to accomplish this. With the three of them combined, their power is enough to overwhelm him. But the tide of the battle begins turning once Moro starts using more of his techniques. He's going to start stealing their energy. It's the only way out of this, it seems. He actually commends them for their power. They're quite strong. And their energy made for a nice snack. Thankfully, he didn't get too much energy from them, but it's still a significant amount. And this leaves the three of them drained, not able to fight anymore. Cargo can't even try healing them. Besides the fact that his healing is pretty weak, he has no energy himself right now. Luckily, some other Namekians come by and help them. As this is happening, Moro goes and gets the Dragon Balls, finally collecting all seven and asking for his wish. By the time these three fighters are back in action, it's already too late. They see Purunga in the sky. Cargo is infuriated, flying off to try and fight him. Piccolo and Gohan try and chase him down. They can't fight him right now. He's too strong. Even if they did, they would just be giving him more energy. It's not like they'll get there in time anyways. They're not going to be quick enough to intervene and stop the wishes. Cargo's disappointed, thinking that the two of them are giving up, but they have a better plan. 
they're going to cut their losses here on Namek. Obviously, they have the ability to restore all the destruction. They just need to make a wish back on Earth. For now, they should retreat, going back to Earth and getting stronger, as well as warning Goku and Vegeta to get them involved. If they go into fight now, they might die, and they'll just be giving more and more energy. Maybe they can even retreat with some Namekians. So, they end up going with this plan. The patrol helps save all the Namekians left here. Mayrus does try to fight Moro one last time, but it doesn't work. He's far too strong right now after getting his wishes, and of course, all the prisoners have escaped too. He agrees with Piccolo and Gohan's idea to go back and retreat. Cargo hopes this is going to work, but everyone seems confident. Piccolo and Cargo decide they're going to stay with the Galactic Patrol to train. Mayrus seems like he has some stuff that he could teach them. And maybe they could finally unlock this power they're trying to get. And as for Gohan, he's going to go back to Earth. He has a great idea of who he can train, Goten and Trunks. They did try and want to unlock Super Saiyan 4 once they're actually fused. And maybe he could help Gotenks accomplish this, even if the two of them can't do it on their own. And obviously, a warning is sent to Goku and Vegeta. They remain on Beerus' planet, continuing their training. While Goku continues trying to perfect Ultra Instinct, Vegeta tries a different path. Okay, if Moro's absorbing energy, maybe he should try using the Hakai. If he can get a grasp on how to use that, that might actually be the key to defeating Moro. Either way, the two of them have good goals in mind. Gohan ends up back on Earth and begins training Goten and Trunks. They're excited. They've wanted to learn Super Saiyan 4 forever, even if it's only when they're fused. But as their training's going on, some of Moro's crew ends up on Earth. And they don't really last too long. With Gohan and Gotenks there, it's pretty much a wash. But this does give them some good news. It seems like they're going to have at least two months to train before Moro gets there. He's going to give them some time. They are great snacks after all. And if he lets them train and get stronger, he'll be able to eat more once he's there. And this works perfectly in their favor. It gives Goku and Vegeta more time to do whatever they're doing, and as for Gohan and his group, they're all going to get a lot stronger in that time frame. Plus, they can even gather up the Earthlings and have them train too. All this while, of course Piccolo and Cargo are with the Galactic Patrol. Mayrus is trying to teach them stuff. He can sense they have trace amounts of godly energy in them, and they're surprised. How is he able to sense that? That's not something that any mortal can sense. This guy's pretty odd. And crazy enough, it seems like he can actually use Ultra Instinct, that thing Goku was using before in the tournament. And Piccolo's pretty quickly able to deduce what's happening here. This man's able to sense godly energy and he can use Ultra Instinct. Is he an angel in disguise, maybe? And Mayrus doesn't even lie. He confirms this. He knew these two seemed pretty smart, and they'd probably see through his disguise. And that's exactly why he's training them. Of course, he can't get involved personally in fight, but there's nothing against him training them. This is basically what Goku and Vegeta are doing with Whis, his older brother. So he may as well try it too. Of course, these two probably aren't going to be able to get Ultra Instinct, but he can tap into their power and help them unlock that godly power that they're trying to get and they show off what they've been working towards. They power up trying to summon all the godly ki within them, and not much physically changes about their appearance. They have a slight red glow to them, and their eyes change color too. But it's kind of tough for them to maintain this, and plus, they know they could probably go beyond this too. They just call this form Namekian god, or even more simply their red-eyed form. Mayrus tells them they're heading down a great path, so he continues working with them as they try and unlock this. Back on Earth, Gohan's making some great progress by spearheading this assault against Moro's crew. Goten and Trunks have grown a lot stronger individually, and it seems that when they fuse, they actually can access Super Saiyan 4 now, and it's kind of weird. Whenever they transform into it, well, they age up completely. Like, Goten stays as a normal child at first, or as normal as two fused half Saiyans can be, and then completely grows up when he transforms. Gohan did experience something similar. It was weird, but kind of cool in a way. But whatever, he doesn't question it. Of course, the humans join him too, and surprisingly, even Dende does. They do remember that Dende did teach Cargo how to heal people, and in exchange, Cargo was trying to teach his brother how to fight better. Of course, Dende's not that powerful as a warrior, but he's slowly getting the hang of it, and maybe Gohan could whip him into shape so he's actually a better fighter. It would be nice to have the Guardian of Earth fighting after all, although they'd have to be really careful to protect him since he is weaker than them, and if he dies, everyone might be doomed. But they're glad and surprised to see that he wants to fight. Two months pass, and everyone feels ready. For Goku and Vegeta, it's going to take them a bit longer, since they're not going to be able to head to Earth until they sense people's energy. They're not going to know when it's going down. But thankfully, as soon as they sense it, Whis is going to be able to take them there pretty quickly. Gohan gets his crew ready. There's some galactic patrolmen there, Goten and Trunks, the humans, and Dende. Moro's crews begin arriving. And thankfully, at first they don't seem like too big of a threat. A lot of them are defeated pretty easily and arrested. But as the fight continues, more and more strong ones begin appearing. Goten and Trunks end up fusing, showing off Super Saiyan 4 Gotenks, and Gotenks begins demolishing all the crews there, alongside his half-brother Gohan. But then they encounter someone really interesting, 7-3. During the battle, he's able to grab onto Gotenks' neck. Gotenks jumps away pretty quickly, thinking that he was about to get killed. But something weird happens. He and Gohan watch on, and they see 7-3 begin making ghosts. Wait, that's Gotenks' technique, how's he doing that? His power increases dramatically, and they realize what happened. 
he just stole Gotenks' power. Gotenks goes to clash with 7-3, and the two are perfectly even. Actually, 7-3 has an advantage when you think about it. He's got infinite energy, so Gohan needs to join in and help Gotenks. With the two of them together, they're able to actually overwhelm 7-3 now. 7-3 tries to steal Gohan's power too, but he's smart enough to avoid this. But it seems like it's not over for 7-3 yet. He has one more trick up his sleeve. They watch as the gem in his head changes, and someone else appears on there, Moro. He stops using Gotenks' powers and begins using Moro's. Crap, this is bad. They try and fend him off, but 7-3 is growing stronger and stronger. And they're getting concerned, but two more powers show up. A ship lands nearby, and quickly, two warriors approach. Surrounded in a bluish-purplish aura, they see that it's Piccolo and Cargo. Dende's amazed. He didn't know Namekians get new forms. He wants to get that. Piccolo and Cargo are just as surprised to see Gotenks in Super Saiyan 4. It seems everyone's made great progress with their training. The four of them fight together. And since there's so many against 7-3, they're able to completely overwhelm him now, even with his energy absorption. They're trying to work as quickly as possible to counter this. Of course, they remember how their fight with Moro went, so they're wasting no time here. And they're trying to avoid key attacks as much as possible. Not only have Piccolo and Cargo grown stronger, but their techniques have become greater too. They're fighting with such grace and speed, and it's incredible to see it in action. Together, all four of them defeat 7-3, completely erasing him to make sure nothing else bad happens. Alright, things are going okay. They've defeated most of Moro's crews and there's only a few people left, and with how many strong people they have now, it should be fine. And now it's time for the main course. Moro begins descending on the planet. He's quite surprised to see that they defeated 7-3, but he says they won't get so lucky with him. He's eaten a bunch of planets in the time that's passed, and gotten a lot stronger along the way. And even if they're stronger, who cares? It's just more energy for him to absorb. He's just gonna get stronger and stronger the more he fights them. But for some reason, the four of them seem pretty confident. He begins the fight, wondering if they have some trick up their sleeves, and it doesn't seem like it. They are pretty strong, and they give Moro a fun time as he fights them. And eventually he begins slowly draining their energy. It's a bit tough at first since they're able to counter it by attacking him mid-absorption, but slowly, they begin getting weaker, and Moro begins draining more and more at a faster pace. But they still haven't given up yet. He wonders what's with this willpower. And suddenly, Moro freezes mid-battle. He senses a presence that makes him shiver. He turns behind him, looking to see nothing. Then, he feels three rapid punches to his back, knocking him forward as he stumbles. He lifts his head up and sees Vegeta standing in front of him. His hand is glowing with purple energy, and he's in his wrathful god form. Moro quickly jumps back as fast as possible, as Vegeta destroys the ground in front of him. But as Moro stumbles back, he bumps into someone. He turns around and sees Goku there. Who are these two people? And while Goku and Vegeta would have loved to fight this guy to his full potential, they can't screw around here. Surprisingly, Goku's an Ultra Instinct Omen. He's been able to access it at will. Sure, he doesn't have the white-haired form, but this is great enough. And even more surprisingly, Vegeta just used that technique that Beerus uses. He used the Hakai, it seems. And that's why Moro was so terrified. He sensed not only Goku's presence, but also Vegeta's destructive tendencies. He swings an arm at Goku trying to attack, lunging it through his chest, but as soon as it hits, Goku just vanishes, appearing above Moro's head, spinning around and kicking him. They've already worked out a great plan. Goku will go in close, working as bait, and Vegeta's gonna try and find an opening to erase him. And the great thing is, with Vegeta's energy, it's not like Moro's gonna be able to absorb it. Moro seems terrified of it, not only because of the potential that he might be erased, but also he can't eat this kind of energy. He's not gonna try to eat a Hakai, that's just bad news. The two work together. Moro tries desperately attacking Goku, but nothing works. And the four other fighters help too, with Dende even healing them mid-battle. Unfortunately, Gotenks defuses, but Goten and Trunks fight together trying their best. And they've still got Piccolo, Cargo, and Gohan there too. They're all getting some great hits in, and now that they're fully healed, they're back at their max power. Goku is serving as a great bait, while these five fighters completely overwhelm him in terms of power, injuring him along the way. Gohan raises a finger up in the air, creating a galactic donut, and Goten and Trunks follow suit. Goten and Trunks bind his arms, while Gohan binds his legs. Moro's able to try and break out of it quickly, but this did help as it stunned him mid-battle, with Goku weakening him more and more. Once again, Moro swings his arm at Goku, but his arm suddenly disappears. Crap, how could he forget? He's so overwhelmed that he completely forgot to look out for Vegeta. He looks back and there's a hand in front of his face once more. Vegeta doesn't even say anything, he just smirks. The entire area is illuminated purple. Moro screams as he's erased, creating a massive explosion, leaving nothing but dust behind. Vegeta and Goku power down, telling everyone they did a good job. Everyone's elated to see how much everyone's grown in terms of power. It has been two months after all since they've all seen each other. Marius looks on happily too. Glad to see all these celebrations. Dende even then gathers her Dragon Balls, wishing to restore everything back to normal. Even if they didn't have Majin Buu and the Grand Supreme Kai to help them, everything went perfectly well. These mortals in Universe 7 are pretty interesting, especially those Saiyans. 
And with that, we can end off the series here. So, what did you guys think about this part? Leave any thoughts in the comments below. I'll be sure to check them out to see what you guys think. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like. And let's try to hit that like goal at the beginning of the video since it lets me know you want to see more like this. If you haven't already, why not subscribe? As well as hitting the bell icon so you're notified about any future uploads on my channel, including more videos like this one. Anyways, thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting this scenario, and I'll see you all in my next video.